Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the LA County Board of Supervisors, which is being held remotely, and today is Tuesday, August 9th, 2022. Um, please note that Supervisor Hahn will not be in attendance at today's meeting. We'll take roll to confirm everyone else. Supervisor Solis, good morning. Good morning, present. Supervisor Kuhl. Good morning, I'm here. Supervisor Barger. I'm here. Good morning. Tisha Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. Good morning, President. Don Harrison, Acting County Counsel. Present. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer. Present. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. So please stand, face a flag, and join me. Please place your right hand over your heart, and let's begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As indicated on the posted agenda, we'll take telephonic public comment during today's meeting. The Executive Office of the Board received over 400 written public comments for today's meeting, and as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisors for their consideration consistent with Brown Act requirement. We'll continue to receive written public comments throughout the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Executive Officer, will you please call the agenda? Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Today's agenda will begin on page two, set matters. Set matter one is a report by the chief executive officer and appropriate department heads as necessary on the status of the American Rescue Plan funding and considerations of necessary action. Items set matter one will be held for discussion. On set matter two, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be continued to August 30th, 2022, as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page three, consent calendar, Board of Supervisors, items three through 13. On item three, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item four, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item five, I'm sorry, on item 10, Supervisor Solis requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 12, administrative matters, items 14 through 49. On item 14, the chief executive officer requests that recommendation number five through 11 be continued to September 6, 2022, as they require all supervisors to be present. The remaining recommendations one through four and 12 can be considered and approved today. On item 20, Supervisor Barger requests that this item be held. On item 26, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 31, this includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda, which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 47C, Supervisor Kuehl would like to revise her motion to find that the crime committed was heinous and increase the reward amount from 10,000 to 20,000. On item 47E, Supervisor Barger would like to abstain from voting. On page 32, ordinance for introductions, items 50 through 52. On page 34, separate matters, 53 and 54. On item 53 is a recommendation to adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of the Linwood Unified School District election of 2016, general obligation bonds, Series C, and an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $24,465,000. Item 54, on item 54 is a recommendation to adopt resolutions to levy the 2022-2023 special taxes for community facility districts number three and seven, and number 2021-02. On page 35, special district agendas. This is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. On page 40, this is the agenda for the Regional Park and Open Space District. On page 42, notices of closed session. Item CS2 is an addition as indicated on the supplemental agenda. 
On page 44, items continue from previous meeting for further discussion and action by the board. Item A10 is a discussion and consideration of necessary actions rela related to declared outbreaks of infectious disease threatening the public's health in Los Angeles County. On item A10, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. The requests for continuances through A10 are before you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Moved by Supervisor Kuhl, seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve these items and such will be the order. That completes the reading of the agenda, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, appreciate that. We'll now transition into public comment for all agenda items. Executive officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board today. Thank you, Madam Chair. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. To repeat, please call 877-226-8163 and use participant code number 1336503. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017 and follow the instructions. To members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which agenda items you wish to speak on. We will allocate 90 minutes for public comment on all of the items posted on today's agenda. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items. In addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total up to three minutes per person. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on the agenda item, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on a topic, or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speakerphone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please? Our first participant is Genevieve Clavriel. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, this is Dr. Genevieve Clavriel. I will speak to item two, seven, and 12 and public comment. Uh, it's totally inappropriate to uh, remove item two to be reviewed now. I guess you're trying to get uh, Dr. Pepper now away from the public after she has totally misrepresented our statistics. That's not the time now, and I think we need to actively deal with multipart thanks to her with, you know, not under control. I'm concerned about uh, the same thing, you know, how long are you going to keep the, you know, boil the clothes? You know, if you keep on, I'm probably going to be 100 by the time they reopen. Anyway, reopen, reopen. And on item 17, I am concerned with that item because the way the motions when it's done is not very explicit. How? the control of the information will be. So <clears throat> I think we should look differently at this and other public comment. I just hope that we have some legal uh, with people who listen to this board and take upon themselves to sue the county or not reopening. As it is now, we have absolutely no way to really act on anything will happen. 
last week, there was a health deputy meeting, lasted only 13 minutes, you know what I mean? To me, that's not a meeting, okay? So please, if it's an attorney around here, we would like to make sure the public has the right to see the supervisors and deal with them in person. Please do it. My phone number is 626-844-7812. 626-844-7812. Have a good week. Hope to see you soon. Bye. We have the next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jerry Thomas. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, my name is Sherry Thomas, member of the Kunal Indian Nation and chair of the Los Angeles Native American Indian Commission, which represents the 233,000 Native Americans in Los Angeles County. I will be speaking on public comment. I would like to thank Supervisor Salise and Hahn for authoring item X, establishing our commitment to the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission. In recent years, the County of Los Angeles has been active in addressing false historic narratives about the land upon which the county sits through actions such as renaming Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day, removing the Christopher Columbus statue in Grand Park, addressing the countywide cultural policy, which includes a directive to develop a land acknowledgement and an access policy, and the cultural equity and inclusion initiative, all actions spearheaded by Supervisor Solis, which we are very grateful for. While these actions are laudable, the county must go further in improving the health and well-being of the American Indian and Alaska Native community. This can be done more effectively by transferring the Indian Commission to the Department of Arts and Culture as a new placement for administrative and opposition. Your time has expired. Yes. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Amparo Oschik. Please state the agenda items you're addressing and whether you'll also address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes. Yes. Is it me? Yes. Yes, please begin. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Amparo Stajik. I'm um, speaking on general public comment. I would like to speak about um, the wage of the United Mental Health Promoters. I want to start by thanking Supervisor Solis for expanding the United Mental Health Promoters. And I work with the uh, United Mental Health Promoters very closely. They do incredible work and reduce stigma via workshops that they present to the community at large. They currently have a difficult time focusing on the ability to do these workshops because their wages are so low, only 16.66 an hour, and they have to have other side jobs. Um, I think um, the, the current um, wage for someone living in Los Angeles without living Excuse below me. poverty level is at least $21. Can we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Wilma Franco. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Wilma Franco and I'll be speaking on item four. Please begin. Thank you. Um, I want to start just by saying thank you to President Mitchell and Supervisor Kuehl for taking the next step in supporting equitable economic recovery in Stella with this motion. I'm Dr. Wilma Franco, Executive Director for the Southeast LA Collaborative, and I'm a member of the Economic Resiliency Task Force and part of the ECC Working Group. As you all know well, our community of proud, resilient working class families was hit hard by the pandemic. In fact, it was coined the epicenter of COVID by the LA Times. We know our communities rely heavily on nonprofit organizations, and truly the nonprofit sector uh, serves as a social safety net in, in our communities. But when we asked the nonprofit leaders working in Salah, they told us the application and reporting processes are too burdensome, oftentimes making it impossible for our Salah organizations to apply and secure contracts, which negative to, negatively impact our communities who have for many years been underserved. This motion will be an important commitment to making public dollars more accessible to organizations like the ones I represent and the people we serve. I've seen an amazing partnership forming between the county staff and not. Can we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Lynn Moses. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment. You may begin. I'll, I'll begin with, um, well, 6, 7, 12, 5, and general public comment, please. 
Okay, please begin. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, number seven, uh, this is the West LA uh, bridge housing, housing project. This project actually looks pretty good um, at, at face value, 167 beds for $26 million. Uh, that's $161,000 per unit or per bed, uh, apparently. That is really pretty good compared to what's, what's going on uh, with the Los Angeles sleazy council of corruption. For instance, the Vermont, Man uh, Vermont and Manchester project, which actually the county is partnering with, they're building no units at $635,000 per unit. The Los Angeles City Council of Corruption and the county shouldn't be part of this. Uh, we'll be looking more into that. Number five, this is the Willowbrook, Willowbrook Three housing project development. Uh, apparently, um, uh, uh, 60, I think 160, 116, 112 units or so. But there's no cost associated with this. Uh, maybe that's going to come later. Maybe I missed something, but uh, it should be transparent. Uh, again, uh, these units are being built for uh, over $700,000 a piece. Uh, total ripoff of HHH funds, um, and compared this to uh, Holly Mitchell's gentrification project of um, Lamert Park. This project isn't going to be finished till 2026, Mitchell. How is that going to be a, a business, a black business preservation project? You're going to tear down the buildings? Where are they going to go? It's a destruction project. Your Holly gentrification project, you're partnering with Wells Fargo, the predatory lender, a convicted felon, and a white nonprofit genesis, all a bunch of corruption. We're asking for a lot of investigations on this one. We're not going to sit down. Picketing of Wells Fargo's already started. Uh, here, number six, you waive gross fees of $5,000 for Swim the Avenue in Redondo Beach. Little be known, Ridley Thomas uh, tried to destroy the black farmer's market in Lamert Park with $5,000 per, per week fees, total corruption. The major problem in the black community is we have no representation in a representative form of government. You said the Pledge of Allegiance, Mitchell, justice for all, Lamert Park, we are going to give a blow by blow of what's happening to this businesses and that community because of what you your time has expired maybe on the next speaker please Thank our next participant is let perez uh, lizette perez please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment you may begin hello my name is lizette perez and i'm addressing section 47c Today, I'm speaking to you as a mother and as the eldest daughter of seven children in a blended family, but most importantly, as the older sister of Freddie Perez. I would like your approval to establish an additional reward in finding the person responsible for my brother's death. On Saturday, July 16th at 1143 p.m., one block from his home in Granada Hills, my brother was killed while attempting to make a left-hand turn into a gas station while riding his motorcycle. The driver was driving a GMC pickup truck. They did not stop to render aid. They did not stop to call 911. They fled. My family is living our worst nightmare. Through all my anger and grief, I have become my family's voice. I have given countless interviews in hopes of finding the killer who killed my brother. In the first few days, I thought maybe they would find their heart and come forward. I could understand if it was an accident and they were afraid, but they didn't stay. It's been over three weeks now, and my hope that this person will turn themselves in has vanished. I don't understand how they're out there living their own lives after killing my brother. How can they look in the mirror? How can their family and friends not say anything? Because I know that someone out there knows something. Finding my brother's killer won't bring him back, but finding him will bring my family closure. The driver needs to know that my brother was an extraordinary man with a heart of gold. He lived for his family and he was about to begin a new chapter in his life. He had plans to propose to his girlfriend the week after he was killed. He was a person whose life mattered, and he is loved tremendously. I hope that you will find it in your hearts to approve the motion to establish an additional reward in finding the person that killed my brother. 
in hopes that this reward will encourage someone with information to come forward. Please do it for my brother and for all the other families who have suffered the same tragedy as ours. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Kathy Vuzu. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Kathy Vu from AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I'm going to be speaking on item A10 and general public comment. Uh, so last week, the board proposed items to advocate for federal and state resources to combat the STD epidemic. Advocating for more state and federal funding is necessary, but LA County already has the resources to combat this epidemic within its own $38 billion budget. The money is an important effort. Using county dollars is a concrete step that county can take to address both monkeypox and STDs. You declared a local emergency on monkeypox just last week. What are you waiting for? LA County is the most populous county in the United States. Its residents deserve a public health infrastructure that not only reacts quickly, but focuses on prevention and innovation for any issue, whether that's for homelessness, monkeypox, COVID, STDs. LA County residents need more than just pretty claims and words. We deserve action and innovation put in the money. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Betty Avila. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you, good morning. Uh, my name is Betty Avila. I'm the Executive Director of self Help Graphics and Art at Chicano Art and Cultural Center with 49 years uh, on the east side. And I'm speaking to item 10. Um, I, as was spoken earlier, there's been a tremendous support of the Indian American, um, Native American Indian Commission at the county level. Uh, thank you so much, Supervisor Solis, for your support um, and the incredible actions that have taken place in the last few years. I do want to indicate support that the commission be moved uh, under the Department of Art and Culture. The two have already fostered a, a strong partnership. They've developed uh, many programs in different ways for the Native community to share their history and culture uh, at the county-wide level and beyond. And this transfer would support, the transfer from the executive office to the Department of Arts and Culture would support the critically unmet administrative needs that the commission uh, has been dealing with to, to do their job well. So thank you so much, Hilton Solis, uh, Supervisor Solis, and the rest of the supervisors for your support. I hope that you undertake this action. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Antion Robinson. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. My name is Antigone Robinson, calling from AIDS Healthcare Foundation to speak on item A1 and general public comment. I'm just here to talk about the epidemics in LA County and say that vulnerable, vulnerable populations in LA continue to be overlooked by the county. Gay and bisexual men are exceptionally vulnerable with the current monkeypox emergency, and yet it took the county two months to act. We see the same inadequate delayed response with the raging epidemics of syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia as well. When will the county learn? We need action and funding immediately. Is there no room within the recommended $38.5 billion county budget to immediately address these ongoing epidemics? Protecting public health is a sacred trust, which Los Angeles County has failed to uphold. $10 million in emergency funding is needed to fight monkeypox and STDs now. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Josh Candelaria. Please state the agenda items you're addressing and whether you'll address some general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, um, Chair Mitchell, board members. Josh Candelaria on behalf of Yohaviatam of San Manuel Nations in support of item 10. Thank you for your leadership and advocacy on behalf of Native people like San Manuel. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Joe St. John. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. 
I'm speaking on item four only. Thank you, Chair Mitchell and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Joe St. John and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Koreatown Youth and Community Center. I'd like to voice my support for the directive extending the Equity and County Contracting Project. The ECC brings together nonprofits, philanthropy, and county staff to find ways to make our services more accessible to underserved communities and to ensure nonprofits who deliver the services are paid fairly and promptly. At KYCC, we have county contracts across six departments, and most of them are designed for us to lose money. There are caps on administrative expenses, on costs that are allowed on some contracts but not others, owner spilling and invoicing processes that vary widely by department, and multi-year contracts that don't include cost of living and minimum wage increases. These are the types of issues that we're addressing in the ECC and we're making progress. Thank you for considering your continued investment in finding solutions to these structural and systemic problems that will benefit agencies across LA County. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Bianca Gallegos. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, um, good morning uh, to the Board of Supervisors. I'd like to address uh, regarding um, requesting an increase in the hourly wage for promoters in Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health to a livable wage of $26 an hour. Poverty Level and Board of Supervisors ARDI Initiative. The ARDI Initiative was enacted by the Board of Supervisors on July 2020 to dismantle racism by in LACDMH. By keeping wage promoters at $16.66, the county is itself contradicting its pledge to eradicate an anti-racism agenda that will guide, govern, and increase the county's ongoing commitment to fighting racism and all its dimensions. According to the livable wage site from Michigan Institute of Technology, a livable wage in Los Angeles County for one person with no children is $21.89 and $30.73 for a person with two children. The minimum wage in LA Excuse County me? is $16. Your time has expired. Cents more. If we have the next speaker, please. Thank you. Our next participant is Joseph Quintana. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment. You may begin. Um, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Supervisors. I hope that you and your families continue to remain well. My name is Joseph Quintana. I'm the Vice President of Development at LA County's largest nonprofit uh, uh, provider of health and human services for American Indians and Alaskan Natives. I want to share uh, my support for um, the uh, motion authored by uh, Supervisor Solis and both reinforcing and establishing our commitment to the LA City County Native American Indian Commission. I appreciate Supervisor's uh, dedicated dedication and her unwavering support of the American Indian community. Together, we've been able uh, to seek out many different uh, successes over the years, including ensuring that mis misrepresentation doesn't continue to happen for Native people, ensuring that Native people have a voice in all LA County affairs, and being able to establish housing access for Native peoples as well. I think uh, this particular motion will allow for stability and ensure that together we can find a home for the LA Excuse City me? County Native American Indian Commission time is in the Culture and Arts Department. Thank you. Have you. The next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lawrence Reyes. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, yes, good morning, supervisors. My name is uh, Lawrence Reyes and I will be addressing item four and public comment. Uh, I am a, a senior community health worker for the Department of Mental Health. I am an, I am an SCIU 721 member and also have uh, worked on many of your campaigns. Uh, being on the ground and providing critical behavior and health services to our communities, I have witnessed firsthand the short staffing within my department. These shortages are not only a result of delays in hiring and onboarding qualified county employees, these shortages also exist within our contracted workforce within LA County. LA County focused on creating a care first model through the the lenses of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I would hope that this board consider measures to prevent attrition and promote retention within the workforce and potential pathways for contract employees 
to become part of the LA County workforce. In your decisions of contract procurement, please make sure to respect your current workforce and contract with entities that provide prevailing wages who treat their employees with dignity and respect. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Helen Hernandez. Please take the regular agenda items you're addressing today and we'll do address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, esteemed members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Helen Hernandez uh, and I am a First District Arts Commissioner um, and I'm also a former co-chair of the Cultural Equity and Inclusion Initiative for LA County. I would like to thank Supervisor Solis for authoring item 10 and establishing our commitment to the Los Angeles County Native American Indian Commission. I'm speaking in support of the transfer from the Executive Office to the Department of Arts and Culture of the Native American Commission as, as to help fund un, their critical unmet needs. It is the very least the board can do as a first step at repairing the harm and trauma caused to this community. Uh, I understand that the two commissions have fostered a strong partnership and developed ways for Native peoples to share their history and culture and provide insight into some of the challenges they have and continue to face. I strongly support and urge your vote on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Adam Cohen. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Adam Cohen. I'm with AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I'm discussing items A1 as well as general public comment. Um, I want to speak about monkeypox and the fact that we are using a pretty uh, archaic system to enter data for vaccinations. We're relying on REDCap, which is excellent for HIPAA, but not great when it comes to keeping track of vaccine administration in the sites. Uh, California's My Turn COVID vaccination database would be the most streamlined way to distribute monkeypox vaccines, but it's currently not being used. And I'd like to know why not. Um, REDCap, as I mentioned, the technology that's currently being used for capturing monkeypox vaccines is antiquated. Anybody can use the link to enter the data. So I'd like to know where the MyTurn system for monkeypox is. So despite vaccine distribution being crucial to our strategy for ending monkeypox, we're using a system that is essentially unfamiliar to many providers and patients alike. Ex ensuring the expedient development of the MyTurn monkeypox vaccine module would have accomplished this goal more effectively and with fewer resources than rolling out a brand new system that requires training. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Jennifer Cuevas. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. My name is Jennifer Cuevas and I'm commenting on item 10 and general public comment. I'm an LA County One resident with Arts for LA, which advocates for arts and culture in Los Angeles County, as well as with Self-Help Graphics and Art, a Chicano and Latinx legacy visual arts organization in its 49th year. I'd like to thank Supervisor Solis for authoring item 10, establishing our commitment to the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission, and urge this board to approve the motion. In recent years, the County of Los Angeles has been active in addressing false historic narratives about the land upon which the county sits on. However, the county must go further in improving the health and well-being of the American Indian and Alaskan Native community. This can be done more effectively by transferring the LA City County Native American Indian Commission to the Department of Arts and Culture as a new placement for administrative and operational support with the opportunity for strategic partnership. The Indian Commission and the Department of Arts and Culture can uh, have fostered and strong, a strong partnership and develop ways for Native peoples to share their history and culture and provide insight into some of the challenges that they have continued to face. Excuse me. Their transfer from the executive office. Your time has expired. Have the next speaker, please. Our next participant is Dominic Newhart. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dominic Winhart. I would like to speak on general public comment. Um, I just want to, uh, since uh, my supervisor, Janice Hahn, I reside in her district, since she has tested positive for COVID, we definitely wish her, uh, her a speedy recovery. Um, and I also wanted to congratulate her on her vice chairship of the Los Angeles County Transportation Authority. 
Also, uh, since Supervisor Hahn is not here, I would like to ask the um, chair or the chair pro tem to um, have an adjourning motion on Ben Scully. He united us in Los Angeles County by sports. And uh, since Supervisor Hahn is not here to do the adjourning motion, um, I ask that one of the supervisors do, do it on her behalf. Thank you very much. That's all I have to address the board. Have a great day, supervisors. I think we have the next speaker, please. Our next participant is Jacqueline Ayer. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, my name is Jacqueline Ayer, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Acton Town Council. I'm speaking on agenda item 20 in general public comment. DCBA shows great disdain for rural communities with this ordinance. DCBA promised that they would write this ordinance based on community feedback. They never solicited feedback from anyone, and they certainly did not reach out to any rural communities. For instance, the DCBA report before you now actually states on page five that outdoor and greenhouse cannabis grows are attractive to the rural communities of North County. Nothing could be further from the truth. Rural communities have consistently asserted that only indoor cultivation is acceptable because that is the only way to control the odor. Urban dwellers would never tolerate their air being permeated with the stench of outdoor cannabis grows or allow their parks and schools to be overwhelmed by such a stench. We can't tolerate it either. You cannot approve this ordinance with an outdoor or greenhouse cultivation tax rate. This ordinance seeks to uh, tax illegal cannabis businesses, and it suggests that instead of eradicating these businesses, the county will just tax them, which will only encourage more of them. Illegal grows are a plague on our community. They take up precious housing stock. They introduce armed guards into our residential neighborhoods, and they are eroding the fabric of our community and our schools because they take over homes that should instead be used for family purposes. You must not approve this ordinance without first making a clear statement that the county is committed to eradicating illegal operations and not just taxing them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lorraine Keonis. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Lorraine has, uh, has removed herself from the queue. Our next participant is Angela E. Angela E, please state the agenda items you're addressing and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, my name is Angela and I would like to comment on public health order item 17 and general public comment. This board continues to claim that their policies are aligned with state and federal health orders, yet no federal agency appears to be following the actual science. Two and a half years in and we're still under a state of an emergency. This board has pushed that children need to be vaccinated against COVID-19. To date, zero children have been, died of COVID. Children have a 99.997% survival rate. The current vaccines are for variants that no longer exist. And there is not one fully FDA approved COVID-19 vaccine available in the US. Moreover, this board has implemented a COVID-19 vaccination policy for county employees, citing that vaccination is the most effective way to prevent prevent transmission, limit hospitalizations, and deaths. This policy is libelous, and this board is relying on the ignorance and fear from their constituents to enforce such po policies <clears throat> and so-called mandates regarding anything COVID-related. As of July 29, 2022, the Vaccine Adverse event, Events Reporting System has 1,371,000 471 reported adverse events regarding the COVID vaccines. There were 29,981 deaths, 171,175 hospitalizations, 133,070 urgent visits, and 201,489 doctor visits, to name a few. Please tell me again how these are considered safe and effective and why children need to be vaccinated, Hilda Solis. Item 17 regarding countywide privacy. Privacy. LA County illegally pre registered all LA County employees into the Fulgent system for maintaining, storing COVID 19 testing and vaccination status, which is known to have ties to the CCP without their knowledge and consent. The contract absolves the board of any liability if Fulgent violates any federal and state laws in connection with accessing, collecting, processing, storing, disclosing, or otherwise using county information and or any information loss, breach of confidentiality, or in incident involving any county information that occurs as a result of the fault or negligence of Fulgent on their systems or networks. This board has also absolved, this board is also absolved of all costs and expenses incurred Excuse me. by the county to remedy Your the effects of such loss. The COVID we have the next speaker, please. 
And as a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press 1, then 0 at this time. Do not press 1 and 0 a second time, or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la supervisora si aún no lo ha hecho, presione 1 y luego el 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y 0 por segunda vez, porque será eliminado de la fila. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Cordelia Esteo. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Hi, my name is Cordelia Stell. I'm director of organizing at Arts for LA, calling today in strong support of item 10. I want to thank Supervisor Solis for her leadership and in solidarity with the LA City and County Native American Indian Commission, urge the board to effectively support their essential work by funding their critical unmet needs, as well as their transfer from the executive office to the Department of Arts and Culture. Arts for LA is a network of over 75,000 advocates working for equitable, healthy, vibrant, and creative LA region for the arts, a mission that simply is not possible until the native culture bearers and traditional stewards of this land have the resources needed to thrive. Arts for LA celebrates all of the, that the strong partnership between the LA and AIC and the Department of Arts and Culture has been able to accomplish with this board's support and the leadership of Supervisor Solis, including the adoption of a countywide cultural policy that includes a directive to develop a land acknowledgement and access policy. Yet we know there is more to be done. So I urge you to vote yes on item 10. And again, thank the supervisor for her leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sergio Vera. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, I'm not just addressing general comment. My name is Sergio Vera. I'm a resident of East Los Angeles. And I'm just calling um, to hopefully get some support uh, for the improvements in the medians in East LA uh, in the Sabre uh, area. Uh, there was a $37 million uh, median project for stormwater capture. Um, 31 of those medians, out of 31 of those medians, only seven were enhanced. The other remaining uh, 24 were left barren. Uh, 112 trees were removed. The turf was removed. So now we just have barren dirt and, and uh, we have dust issues. Uh, dirt issues. When it gets windy, dirt is being thrown everywhere. <clears throat> our, the health of our community is is, is being impacted. Um, and then, you know, we were promised all these medians to be enhanced, and now it, we, they were just left barren. The the company Buntech came in, destroyed one median with their headquarters there, and and supervisors released. We're just we want a meeting. We want somebody to come in and give us an update on what's going on. Please, um, it, it's it's really sad. Come down to our neighborhood, take a look. It, Excuse me. It, it's bad, and, and I'm time just has expired. Please, thank you. Yeah, the next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lauren Natoli. Please state the agenda items you are addressing today, and whether you address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, hi, my name is Lauren Natoli. I'm calling from AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, I am commenting on item A10. LA County is touting their work with the community in the ongoing monkeypox and STI crisis. But having a call with throngs of people is not the same as coordinating with lead agencies. The lack of response and communication from the county when community partners such as AHS repeatedly reach out and offer support is unacceptable. AHS has sounded the alarm and offered our support and resources on the monkeypox crisis starting in May. Yet, monkeypox has only been acknowledged by the county in recent weeks when the crisis became too big to ignore. We cannot afford to fall into the same mistakes of waiting for things to become dire before we act. So, we ask that the county take prevention more seriously and listen to community members when we voice our concerns. It is not too late to curb the monkeypox or STI epidemics, but if we continue down the path of an action, we will continue to suffer. Thank you for your time. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Andrea Garcia. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, good morning. My name is Andrea Garcia and I'm commenting on item number 10. I'm a member of the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission. And I'd like to thank Supervisor Solis and Han for authoring item 10. 
Among the many important reasons already cited in the motion and by prior speakers today, this move will also ensure that we can continue to fulfill our function of getting critical grants out to community agencies in a timely manner due to the infrastructure that currently exists within the Department of Arts and Culture. As someone who works both at the commission level and on the front lines of native homelessness, I've seen the critical role that these grants fulfill for people experiencing homelessness or other hardships. Any potential delays due to the lack of appropriate infrastructure would be a disservice to those who rely on these funds. For these reasons and those already stated in the motion, I support this move and thank you, um, Supervisor Solis and Han, for um, supporting this motion. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Oscar Chanel. Please state the agenda items you're addressing and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. <laughs> Hello, my name is Oscar Canales. I'll be addressing, uh, addressing the board and give general public comment. Before ruin, a man's heart is proud. Humility goes before honor. To answer a man before hear, hearing him out is foolish and disgraceful. A man's spirit can sustain him through illness, but low spirits, who can bear them? The mind of an intelligent man acquires knowledge. The ears of the wise seek out knowledge. I love the Lord, for he, my voice, he hears my voice, my pleas, for he turns his ear to me whenever I call. The bonds of death encompass me. The torments of Shuol overtook me. I come upon trouble and sorrow, and I invoke the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save my life. The Lord is gracious and beneficent. Our God is compassionate. The Lord protects the simple. Excuse me. I was brought low and he saved me. Your time Be has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is David Juarez. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, supervisors. My name is David Juarez, and I'm with the California Restaurant Association, and I am calling support for item 47A. At the height of the pandemic, many restaurants closed their doors due to COVID-19 and the government ordered closures of indoor dining rooms. Unfortunately, now that restaurants are trying to reopen, they are being told that they are no longer able to operate the way they used to. They are not able to sell alcohol due to do their deem approved status being revoked. This resolution will allow them to sell alcohol again while they go through the process of obtaining a condition of use permit. It's going to allow them to stay afloat as they go through this new lengthy permitting process. So with that, I would like to thank Supervisor Mitchell and Barger for introducing this resolution, and I urge and I vote on item 47A. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Eric Previn. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. Yeah, I'll address several items, and I'll also give a general public comment. How much time will be afforded? Two minutes. Three minutes? Three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for responding. I appreciate that. Um, you know, the county, once again, has a robust agenda. And I, you know, I just want to note that you've got the DA's annual federal equitable sharing agreement, which is where basically the district attorney from time to time runs into criminals who have assets that he seizes. This is asset forfeiture kind of. And then that money, about a million plus dollars, is spent on law enforcement, uh, whatever that means. So the, whatever that means is what we're interested in. The public in the past has reviewed these documents, and there's a clarification and explanation about how much was seized and for what purpose and by whom, you know, from whom, and then also how that those funds are expended. So I'd like that to be more clear before you vote on it. It's not it's not taken lightly by the public when you take stuff from folks. Uh, and I like the idea of reorganizing the PIO, Public Information Office Departments at the Board of Supervisors. Uh, they do an excellent job. Beaches and Harbors, obviously world-class, and uh, the coroner who has their hands full, obviously. But the one key detail is that none of those PIOs are represented employees. Why not? Why not, Chairman Mitchell? Why can't the PIOs have the representation that all the other employees have. Okay, item four is nobody loves procurement 
uh, more than Mitchell and Kuehl, and they're really trying to make it easier for the world. We've got $6 billion in procurement opportunities for all these small businesses, and yet let's roll back the tape to the public comments about Lemert Park and those small businesses. What are you doing for the low-hanging fruit businesses that are very important to a cultural part of our city and town that's being overrun by rapacious gentrification assholes. Please, please, uh, you know, take some strong action in the right direction. Now, 47E is so important. This is where you've got terrible things happen to people. They get abused, and you have reporting laws. And the laws have been set up so that now, if you see something to someone being elderly abused, for example, you have to call the police. But what this sensitive idea is to require that not necessarily the police, unless there's a gun or a suicide involved, instead reach out for services. And I like this idea because it kind of, uh, it allows people to get help rather than be afraid by turning in their brother or their father or their sister. You know, they, they, they can get the appropriate, um, you know, attention. So good work on that. Uh, not good work on holding back, putting up uh, public restrooms in the metro stations. Here you have six capital restroom projects. And by the way, nice work out at uh, me? El Carrizo. Your time has expired. I beg your pardon? Maybe we have the next No, no, I have more time. I Our next participant is Sigourney Piaz. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Sigourney Pies. I'm with the California Native Vote Project, and I would like to thank Supervisor Solis for authoring item 10, um, establishing our commitment to the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission and urge the board to approve the motion. In recent years, the County of Los Angeles has been active in addressing, addressing false historic narratives about the land upon which the county sits on. Um, the county must go further in approving the health and well-being of American Indian and Alaska Native communities. This can be done more effectively by transferring the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission to the Department of Arts and Culture as a new placement for administrative and operational support with the opportunity for strategic partnership. The LACC and NAIC and the Department of Arts and Culture have fostered a strong partnership and developed ways for Native peoples to share their history and culture and provide insight into some of the challenges they have and continue to face. Excuse me. The transfer from the Your time has expired. Can we have the next speaker, please? Thank you. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press 1, then 0 at this time. Do not press 1 and 0 a second time, or you will be removed from the queue. We will now have the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la supervisora, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione 1 y luego el 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y 0 por segunda vez, porque será eliminado de la fila. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Roxanne Beckford. Please state the agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, I am addressing set item two and also general public comment. Um, I have questions for the board. First of all, it's very concerning. Do you know that LA Public Health is no longer allowing the public to interact with them on any social media platforms and that your own meetings are also, um, comments have been turned off which is an, a way that 10 million people do get to interact with each other and with you. Also, we talk so much about equity. Hilda Solis, are you comfortable with the racist bullying ad that LA Public Health put out recently that depicts a white person telling two black girls that if they don't get vaccinated, they won't be able to be friends with her? It's quite disturbing and I suggest you watch it especially since I don't know if you know. Another question, do you know that Barbara Ferrer, um, who mistakenly uses the doctor title that makes people think she's a medical doctor, um, that she said vaccines don't work so great? I know that Janice Hahn is dealing with that right now and I hope she feels. 
she feels better. But why are you allowing Dr. Ferrer to subvert your authority and use a backdoor of the 10-day close contact rule to still have masking of our children, our children who are not at grave risk from COVID. Why is she still doing that? Why is her daughter's report for which her daughter did not uh, reveal a conflict of interest still the basis for masking our children? Are you aware of her abuse of county employees that at the beginning of COVID, making them go out and work without PPE and her continued bullying now, telling them that they cannot communicate with the public or with other people. Thank you for all your work and exposing and, and please pay attention to Mike Antonovich and Don Kanabi who suggest that Barbara Ferrer be fired. She's damaging our businesses, our children and our county. Your Thank time you has so expired. much. We have the next speaker, please. Our next participant is Joey Williams. Please state the agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, thank you, board. My name is Joey Williams. I'm the director of organizing with the California Native Vote Project. And I just want to thank uh, Supervisor Solis and Han for authoring item 10, which I'll be speaking on in general public comment. Um, in Americans, we suffer some of the highest suicide rates, incarceration rates, police brutality rates per capita. That's why it's imperative that the board fully fund the LA County City American Native American Indian Commission. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, black, centering black and indigenous and people of color communities, but one a better way to do that is also to fund our communities. And for so long, our communities have been erased, have been voiceless, and we're asking that they also move the commission from the executive office to the arts and culture um, department uh, where it'll be much more appropriate. And so what I'm asking today is that you, the board would pass item 10 and fully fund the commission and also make the move from the executive office to arts and culture. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Manisha Penisa. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, my name is Manisha Penessa and I am with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I'm a community activist and I own the International Volunteer LLC. Um, today I am speaking on items, agenda items number 10 and also I'm in favor of it and uh, items number four, five and six and I wanted to make general public comments. Um, okay, so I definitely agree with the executive board moving to the arts and cultural um, like scene and department instead because it would definitely benefit our community um, and beautify it. And I'm with items number four, five, and six because it's for the nonprofits and it would help with resources to provide safe havens, um, more transitionals, and housing. Um, we do have that big epidemic at Skid Road, at the highways, under the bridges, on the sidewalks, um, where these buses from out of town are coming in to our community and just dumping people off like it's a landfill still. Um, I think that the wages should be um, booted up to 22 and living expenses should go down, um, that the money should be redirected. Uh, as far as our measurements that have been passed already, like the one with the H in it, or it has several H's, I'm really not sure, but I know that the money hasn't been re re redirected and um, calling 311 is just not working. Um, with COVID, we still need a lot of resources and coming back with um, item number 10 or 810, I'm sorry, uh, with the smallpox. I really don't want to go back into like an epidemic or a pandemic like how we did with COVID-19. Um, so like free buses and Wi-Fi would be nice. I know that's off topic, so I'm not going to really go there. But um, I really want to thank Solis and and um, Supervisor Han for um, incorporating the Native Americans and the Indian community, um, as well as um, looking out for the rest of our community and um, especially homelessness. That's what I'm really out here for, um, being outreach. I've seen a lot of, um, you know, discrimination and, and hardships with that. So I definitely am for and in favor for item number four, five, six, 
and 10. Thank you for letting me speak. Have a blessed day. Bye. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Patrick O'Rourke. Please state the agenda items you are addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, my uh, name is Patrick O'Rourke, agenda items 28A4 and public comment. Uh, the answer, I would like to propose that an anti-eviction task force be set up with a special call center to receive calls for constructive and illegal evictions that are aggravating our homeless issues to this day. In that, I also like to address 28 in the fact that the in light of the recent NPR article, the hidden costs of, of, of foster care were the social services of child services, mental health, and DPSS all come together to incarcerate children into foster care. This is not acceptable. It puts our children at risk, not only of COVID-19, but sexual exploitation, misuse, and all of this is for infractions like uh, non, not being able to have access to county services or language barriers, losing your job. This is aggravating the homeless and the, uh, and the foster care system in this county. It is creating a system of uh, where children are removed from their families, they have no medical history now, and they're put with other families that they don't belong with. They, just, they are traumatized, they are medicated because of that traumatization, and then the county gets more money. That is unacceptable. It is exploitation of children in itself. In addition, the courts allow, the children's courts allow false information, bootstrapping, and all manner of uh, attorney violations of law and due process to keep these children and to permanently remove them for, for such, uh, for things such as not having enough food on the table, uh, domestic violence disputes where the perpetrator has been re already removed from the house or recent job loss. This is only creating more problems for the family. I, I would suggest that the county redirect those services, the, the foster care agency to go ahead and make sure that these parents first have access to pantry programs, to job relocation, and that they be put in the top tier immediate services to reduce the cost to the county. Lastly, an audit of child services and how they're spending their money and how they're stealing social security checks from these children needs to be implemented, including the misuse of funds for Your time has parents. Expired. We have the next speaker, please. Mr. Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Thank you very much. Um, and to make sure that we, we allow the full 90 minutes for public comment, uh, the call in line will remain open until 1110 a.m. and we'll take any other callers that come in by that time. So we thank you for your patience. Colleagues, in the meantime, while we're waiting, we're gonna transition. One moment. Okay. Uh, we're going to go back to public comment because we just got four more callers who uh, um, entered the queue. So we'll go back to public comment. Thank you. Our next participant is Candy McCovey. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. I will be addressing item number 10 in general public comment. My name is Candy McCovey. I'm the Acting Executive Director for California Need to Vote Project, whose mission is to achieve equity and justice for Native American children, families, and community by increasing Native civic participation and power. I am speaking on behalf of our community. I would like to thank Supervisor Solis 
for authoring item number 10. I strongly encourage this board to approve the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Ryan Evans. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning. My name is Ryan Evans. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm speaking about items four and public comment. Um, my name is Ryan Evans and I am a proud member of SEIU Local 721 and I have been a county employee for over eight years. Um, prior to my public service as an LA County employer, I was a Apple One contracted employee for seven years with the probation department. I was privileged enough to find a pathway to permanent county employment. Unfortunately, not all contracted employees are, are afforded the opportunity that I was. History has taught us that good union jobs, especially in the public sector, have been the driving force and preserving the middle class, not to mention LA County is committed now more than ever to eliminate barriers to employment, including immigration status. As you take up this motion to expand diversity and inclusion within the contracting process, I also ask that this board include opportunities to permanent county employment, making sure that those desiring to do business with the county provide prevailing wages and benefits. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Susan Zanter. Please state the agenda items you're addressing and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Item number 20 and general public comment. I'm director of the Association of Rural Town Councils. And I want to say any proposal that even hints to support legalization of cannabis hits a raw nerve with rural communities especially when the illegal growing operations continue in the Antelope Valley, funding for law enforcement is cut, and prosecution is almost non-existent. There's nothing to deter this kind of activity that threatens our communities. Despite the county's claim that this ordinance does not legalize cultivation, it proposes to collect taxes on illegal operations, essentially inviting illegal cultivation and businesses and income they could bring to the county. DCBA in its letter under fiscal impacts and financing uses the term indoor mixed light cultivation for licensing, which means houses in our communities will continue to be converted to illegal grow operations and greenhouses will continue to proliferate unabated. Funds generated from licensing will be spent on community programs with no mention of enforcement funding allocation needed to protect the health safety, and well-being of rural residents from illegal growth and businesses. California and other states with legal cannabis businesses have seen an increase in illegal operations and violent crime related to cartels, water usage, housing, and environmental pollution, like we've already seen in the Antelope Valley. We want protection from this scourge on our communities and look to you. I ask that illegal growth and related activities be completely eradicated before any action is approved to legalize, license, and tax cannabis. Please, please, please help us protect our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Huey Robocastle. Please state the agenda items you're addressing and whether you'll address some general public comment. You may begin. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, please begin. Hello? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Jouet Royball Castle, and I'm calling in regards to um, general item number 10. Um, I'm Osage Shawnee and Creek, and I'm calling from Tongva Territory that you all know as Los Angeles. And I'm calling in support of item number 10 and want to thank Supervisor Hilda Solis for recognizing the Native American community. Um, as an indigenous person, I grew up, and one of the things that probably saved me growing up was the East Los Angeles Music and Arts School. And so I wanna advocate um, as a community organizer with the California Native Vote Project that these types of programs are important for our youth. And so we wanna see crime go down, so let's start where, where the root is and it's with our children and our communities. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak today and wish you all a great day. Thank you, next speaker, please. 
Our next participant is Ian Rosen. Please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, you no, know, I'm just gonna give a general public comment that down at Grand Park at City Hall, the supervisor should go out and testify against the ordinance 4118, which I'm sure the supervisors are not for the extended criminalization Excuse me. of the homeless. Maybe we have the next speaker, please. Penalizing people for being uh, Mr. Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board. Thank you very much. Let's pause for a second to see if anybody's going to queue up like they did previously. Anyone has? Yeah, we do have uh, two. We do have one more in queue. Okay, let's hear from them. Our next participant is Richard Hernandez. Mr. Hernandez, please state the agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning and thank you, Supervisor Solis and the Los Angeles Board of Supervisors for your time. It's been a long morning. I hope to bring you some cheer. I plan to address item four, the plan to implement priority strategies to set up an external source looking to establish new ways to increase qualified businesses to succeed. And item 53, the issuance and sale of general obligation bond. They are both hooked together. Uh, and in a way that you don't, you, uh, I will explain. Uh, I am, my name is Richard Hernandez and I'm director of Estamos Contigo Safe Harbor or a liberal, liberal translation means we provide you a safe harbor. First, I wanted to thank the board for their innovative uh, program, Prosper LA, that actively reaches out to the community for any possible avenues for savings to prosper. My company's only purpose is to eliminate debt costs while the board is actively seeking any possible savings for the county. The cost of ongoing projects will provide the savings you are looking for, as strange as that may seem. I have submitted for a utility patent for analysis of municipal debt and its solution and have a copyright application in written form also in the process. The financial accuracy accuracy of the savings and term reductions produced by our platform will be verified by a state licensed real estate loan broker at any meeting date of your choosing. I am asking the board to consider evaluating our solution and its, and its impact on the budget. I have submitted a request to meet with Supervisor Solis with my contact information to explain the platform and what is needed to participate. I sincerely thank you for your consideration and I relinquish the floor. Thank you. Next speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one, then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We now hear the Spanish interpretation of the reminder. Como recordatorio para dirigirse a la supervisora, si aún no lo ha hecho, Presione uno y luego el cero en este momento. No presione uno y cero por segunda vez porque será eliminado de la línea. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Maria Balamel. Please state the agenda items you're addressing and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you. My name is Maria Villamil, Senior Programs Manager for California Native Wood Project. I will be addressing item 10. I'm here representing the voices of Native American and Indigenous families that we serve while we collectively build leadership and civic engagement. I would like to thank Supervisor Hilda Solis for presenting item 10 and urge this board to also approve the motion. In recent years, our organization has worked with the Native Commission and County of Los Angeles supervisors in addressing false historical narratives about the land of, on which the county sits through many different policy changes and actions. While these actions are recognized by our community, we ask that you take another step forward in the right direction and continuing to improve the well-being of our community by transferring the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission to the Department of Arts and Culture. 
This transfer from the executive office to the Department of Arts and Culture, as well as funding for their critical unmet needs, is what this board can do to show authentic leadership to repair centuries of inequity, violence, and harm our community has faced. Thank you once again. I urge for this board to support and approve the motion for item 10. Have a good day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mr. Chair, there are no other speakers in queue to address the board at this time. All right, um, colleagues, again, our 90 minutes will officially end at 11.10 a.m. And so what we're going to do is transition to adjournments in memory, again, leaving the line open once we um, complete adjournments in memory. If there are still members of the public who have called in and in the queue, uh, we will transition um, back over to them to allow their full 90 minute period for public comment. So uh, we're gonna start with district two. Uh, and again, we're transitioning into adjournments in memory. And uh, it saddens me to say colleagues that, that both of mine today um, are deeply troubling to me because um, they are people who lost their lives very early and lost as a result of really quite one violent crime, one horrific, and, and several others as a result of a horrific car accident. So let me begin. I move that today when we adjourn. We adjourn in the memory of Severino Gutierrez Valles. Mr. Valles was the victim of an armed robbery while working as a street vendor this past Thursday, August 4th, in the unincorporated community that I represent known as East Gardena. He succumbed to his injuries at the hospital uh, later that same day at the age of 34. He was well known in the community and residents looked forward to seeing him on the corner of Rosecrans and Main Street every day, as that had been his routine for many years. He was lovingly known in the community as Elias. He will be remembered as a hard worker and most importantly, a loving husband and father. He is survived by his wife, Adriana Flores Rodriguez and their seven-year-old daughter, as well as a host of family, friends, and neighbors who will miss him dearly. And colleagues, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of a family and three still yet to be identified victims of the horrific car crash in the Windsor Hills community. On August 4th, 2022, around 2 p.m., 23-year-old Ashery Shatania Ryan, her 11-month-old son, Alonzo Luciano Quintero, and her unborn child, were identified of three of the victims of the tragic car accident in Windsor Hills. According to Ms. Ryan's family, she was on her way to a prenatal appointment. Ms. Ryan, her children, and three yet to be identified individuals were struck at high speed by a driver who ran a red light at the intersection of Slauson Avenue and La Brea Avenue. Ms. Ryan was born September 15, 1998 here in Los Angeles. She attended Emerson Middle School and Inglewood High School. On August 17, 2021, she gave birth to Alonzo, whom she referred to as her rainbow baby. She was a stay-at-home mom who was studying criminal justice at West LA College. Alonzo was two weeks shy of his first birthday and again was described as a loving baby full of joy. Miss Ryan will be remembered as a loving and proud mother and as a great daughter, sister, and friend who had a bright future ahead of her. She enjoyed spending time with family and taking her son to the park. At the time of her passing, she was again preparing for the arrival of her second child. She leaves behind to cherish her memory, her mother, Sharita, stepfather, Lloyd, sisters, Shansia, and Cody, and a host of family and friends who will miss her 
and her children infinitely. I think it's also important to acknowledge that the Windsor Hills community has been deeply, deeply um, moved and touched by this horrific accident, and they have come together um, in a real meaningful way to provide support to each other as they try to um, get through this tragic, very public event. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm so uh, really without words about how sad this event that you've um, adjourned about. And um, I, I would really, if it's appropriate at all, since I grew up right there, if I may join you in, in those adjournments. Be my um, honor. I see you also, Supervisor Barger. Thank you. And Supervisor Thank Solis, you. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, mine, my adjournments today are, uh, well, you're, it's never joyful to adjourn for people, but at least honoring three people who had a full life and uh, who, who were well known in their own way to so many people. So I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Herma Altschul, who grew up in Chevy Hills, lifelong LA re resident, avid lover of the arts. She was a founding member of the Museum of Contemporary Art and remained involved in its projects council throughout all these years. She was a docent at the Museum of Science and Industry and a patron of the theater and the opera and the LA Phil. Uh, she survived by her husband, Joel, her children, Andrew, Julie, and Mark, her sister, Carol, and her brother, Robert. And I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of one of our, America's favorite, I guess she was called a pop singer, but I think she was more than that, Olivia Newton-John. Um, she became one of our most popular singers in the 1970s, but her fame was really cemented when she co-starred with John Travolta in Greece. Um, Everybody, I mean, now TikTok would be full of those moves. I'm just saying it was not the standard at the time, but we did our best. Uh, over her lifetime, she won four Grammy Awards. She sold more than 100 million albums. She and her husband were active in cancer research and a, always a woman to give back for what she considered the great luck of her life, established a foundation to advance research in plant-based treatments for cancer. She survived by her loving husband, John Easterling, and a daughter from her first marriage, Chloe. And finally, I ask, um, Hilda, you want to join on Olivia Newton-John? Everybody, all four of us, great. Thank you so much. Uh, and finally, and I'm sure you'll want to join in this as well, our favorite sports broadcaster of all time, Vince Scully who died on August 2nd, the undisputed voice of the LA Dodgers. He was known for his amazing ability to tell stories that perfectly painted the picture of the game for the audience, people just listening, not really watching. Although we would all essentially turn down the sound from the TV and turn up Vin Scully when we were watching a game. His time with the Dodgers was highlighted by so many iconic moments, including a no-hitter thrown by Clayton Kershaw and Kirk Gibson's walk-off homer in game one of the 1988 World Series. Even, even Vin was almost without words. His 67 years with the team set a record for the longest any broadcaster worked with a single team in the history of professional sports. He had a gift for how much to tell the audience, knowing when to stop talking and let the game speak for itself. His career was highlighted with a Ford C. Frick Award, which is given to an announcer every year for contributions to the game. But he was also awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In 2010, the American Sportscasters Association named him the greatest sportscaster of the entire 20th century not too shabby. I mean, this was a guy, I think we all loved him, 
um, lived a very good life, so good on him. He survived by his children, Kevin, Todd, Aaron, Kelly, and Catherine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I see uh, Supervisor Solis waving, so I think that um, everyone would really appreciate joining you in the last one as well. Supervisor Barger. Thank you. And I, too, want to thank you, Chair Mitchell, for allowing us to co-author um, um, the adjournments. Uh, heartbreaking, um, and there are no words. So um, with that, I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Russell Pierce, a longtime Antelope Valley teacher. Russell Kurt Pierce passed away July 30th at the age of 92. Born May 8th in 1930, Russell served in the United States Army as a military policeman. Russell held a master's degree in education and was a teacher at Antelope Valley High School for 30 years. A member of the Lancaster Church of Christ since 1959, Russell served as a deacon, elder, and a teacher, and enjoyed leading the congregation in singing. An experienced craftsman, Russell built and maintained many projects for his church, home, and family. Russell survived by Laban, his wife of 70 years, his sons Thomas, Timothy, and Stephen. Son Philip passed away in June of 2022. And I move that the Board of Supervisors adjourn in memory of the following individuals who are identified as indigent veterans by the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner and were subsequently buried with dignity and honor at Riverside National Cemetery in the last month. David Luther DeVellers, Army, Herbert Minky, Army, Kevin Wayne Richmond, Army, Mark Stephen Lloyd, Army, Robert Wayne Hutchins, Air Force, Richard Allen Matlock, Air Force, Edward Macias Obledo, Army Corps, William Arthur Matzner, Army, may their contributions and sacrifices in service to our country never be forgotten. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, and Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, today I move that when we adjourn, that we adjourn in memory of Salvador Avila. Salvador Avila, the patriarch and founder of the Mexican restaurant chain known as Avila's El Ranchito, was born in Michoacan, Me Mexico on 1921 and passed away on Tuesday, August the 2nd, 2022. In 1946, he married Margarita Avila and migrated to California to work in the fields. He came to the United States as part of the Bracero program and picked celery and tomatoes until he saved enough money to bring all his family here. In 1958, the Avila family migrated to the United States to settle in Southeast Los Angeles. In 1966, the Avila family borrowed $2,000 from family members to buy a cafe in the city of Huntington Park to turn it into a Mexican restaurant. And believe me, it is a landmark. They had no previous restaurant experience, but he trusted his wife, Margarita's recipes and saw this opportunity as an opportunity from God. Three generations worked nonstop to make this dream a reality. And in 1970, the company began expanding and now there are 13 family run restaurants throughout Southern California. Mr. Avila became the owner of one of the Southern California's most successful restaurants. Mr. Avila is survived by his daughters, sons, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. He was an amazing husband, father, grandfather, and we will sorely miss him. May he rest in peace. And finally, colleagues, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of the off-duty Monterey Park police officer who was shot and killed in the city of Downey yesterday afternoon. While his name has not been released, I would like to say that my thoughts are with him, our prayers are with the family and with all his loved ones. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my adjournments. Thank you very much, Thank you very supervisors. Much. Um, we'll take all the motions as seconded and if, if there's no objection to a unanimous vote, such will be the order. Again, 11.10 is the time at which we can continue on with our agenda. We will keep the lines open to see if any additional members of the public call in to provide public comment. We appreciate your patience.
with the uh, time, hour of 11.10 having arrived, we didn't have any additional speakers call in colleagues. So our public, our time for public speakers has ended. So thank you to all that called in to speak. And if you are unable to provide your comments, you may submit written comments as indicated on the agenda. We'll continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Executive officer, please indicate the agenda item numbers on which we will be voting today. The following items are before you. Item three, five through nine, 11 through 13. 14 with recommendations number one through four and 12 to be approved today, 15 through 19, 21 through 46, 47A and 47B, 47C as revised, 47D, 47E with Supervisor Barger abstaining from the vote, 47F, 50 through 54, 1D through 7D, 1P through 3P. Thank you. Moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve these items. Please call the roll. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you. We'll begin with set matter one and which will be followed by items A10, then item four and 10, and we will finish with item 20. Again, our set matter one, which is our American Rescue Plan funding report. Um, we'll hear from Dr. Um, D'Artanian Scores, Executive Director of our Racial Equity, and uh, Raphael Carbajal, Director of Consumer and Business Affairs. Good morning to you both. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, Supervisors. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you again today. Uh, today marks the 15th update in our series of regular presentations on the county's progress implementing your board's vision for the American Rescue Plan Phase 1 spending plan. Next slide. As is our regular practice, this slide previews the topics we intend to cover today. I will provide a brief global program overview detailing the current status of our projects and their path to completion. Uh, and then Director Carbajal, uh, who leads the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs, will present on their State House program, one of the many ARC-funded projects focused on service, on serving people who are experiencing homelessness. Next slide. Supervisors, since the update on project approvals and the presentation uh, deck were provided as of August 5th, I'm happy to report that additional designs have since moved through the approval process, with the remaining designs being finalized at this time. As of August 8th, uh, there are only 18 projects instead of the 24 that remain. Our RD team has and will continue to host uh, what we are now calling our design summits to assist departments with expediting the completion of their projects. One such summit yielded a completion of eight projects in one day as we provided technical assistance to departments to get them across the finish line. 63 projects have been approved for launch and implementation, including projects that were expedited um, as well as supported uh, in funding areas that were allocated by the, by the board to uh, sustain our pandemic response uh, services, our disaster service worker program, and centralized administrative expenses related to the response. Um, a total of these, pro of these 63 projects have been approved for launch, which now uh, represent $867,900,000 and equals approximately 89% of our tranche one funds. Next slide. So as of July, 2022, um, 25 projects have launched or are partially launched. And that represents 43.9% of all of our approved projects and 30.9% of all projects. 10 projects were launched uh, by the end of July and 33 projects are expected to launch by the end of September with 13 projects being launched after September. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Director Carbajal, who will highlight the State House ARC funded initiative uh, at this uh, today. Uh, next slide, Director Carbajal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scorza, uh, Madam Chair and Honorable Board. Thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, today's discussion. 
uh, Rafael Carvajal, and I have the privilege of leading the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. Uh, we're a program center around protecting the economic well-being of our consumers, immigrants, tenants, and workers. And this includes our access to justice programs that provide legal assistance and dispute resolution services to our residents. Uh, included in this is our county's eviction defense and prevention program, also known as Tejas LA County, which was bolstered with Tranche One American Rescue Funds. Uh, and today I'm here joining you to provide updates on this project. Uh, so next slide, please. So Stay House LA is a partnership between the County of Los Angeles, the City of LA, and 25 nonprofit community organizations and legal aid providers. The program provides county tenants with the information, resources, services, and the support they need to exercise their rights and remain safely in their homes. The first iteration of the program launched in June 2020 in response to the pandemic to help stem evictions and keep people housed during the COVID emergency. Next slide, please. The program provides our residents with culturally and linguistically access accessible outreach and education on tenants' rights and resources. This includes almost daily virtual workshops, targeted in-person workshops, pop-up informational sessions, and door-to-door -door community canvassing, helping us meet our residents where they are. It also includes an individualized tenant navigation services. This includes a triage of issues and needs, assistance with completing forms and paperwork, and connecting them to resources as they work through their housing crisis. The program also includes limited or full scope legal representations for eligible tenants. Limited scope legal services include one-on-one -on -one consultations, advice, of, uh, advice on unlawful detainer cases um, and housing matters, assistance with filing or completing forms and correspondence. For those eligible for full scope legal representation, it includes comprehensive legal assistance, such as representing tenants at unlawful detainer trials, uh, in settlement negotiations or administrative proceedings. And finally, in an effort to prevent eviction, evictions and disruptive displacements and to help stabilize our tenants, the program offers short-term rental assistance for those eligible tenants. Next slide, please. The Statehouse program aims to provide tenants living in vulnerable and historically underserved communities as our chair is quickly to reframe for us unfinished communities with these re resources. Outreach and education on tenants' rights and resources, including workshops, are available to all our county residents. But there is eligibility criteria for legal services and short-term rental assistance. To be eligible for legal assistance, your household must earn less than 80% of the area median income, or AMI, reside in a highly vulnerable community as identified via the Tenant Vulnerability Index and the county's COVID-19 Vulnerability and Recovery Index, and also not reside within the city of LA. So who may qualify for short-term rental assistance? Well, residents who meet the criteria for full, limited, uh, or full scope legal assistance may be eligible for one of two levels of assistance. Households making up to 80% AMI may be eligible for up to nine months of rental assistance or up to $12,500 $12, in assistance, whichever is less. Households in unincorporated LA County making up to 30% AMI may be eligible for up to 12 months of rental assistance or up to $20,000 in assistance, whichever is less. So I must add a quick note. All tenant households in the County of Los Angeles are potentially eligible for services funded through ERP Tranche 1, but it does exclude those that reside within the boundaries of the City of Los Angeles. So I noted earlier, the City of LA is a great partner with us in this program, and LA City tenants are potentially eligible for these services too, but these services are funded separately by the City of LA. Next slide, please. As shared, the program places particular emphasis on targeting these services to low-income, high-vulnerable communities. Our team and partners identify these communities using the Tenant Vulnerability Index and the County's COVID-19 Vulnerability and Recovery Index. So some examples of neighborhoods that have been identified as low-income and highly vulnerable communities include Bassett, Unincorporated East LA, Athens, East Rancho Dominguez, Willowbrook, Unincorporated San Fernando, Southgate, Cudahy, Lake Los Angeles, Lancaster, and Palmdale. Unfortunately, the list is too long to list them all, but these are just some examples I wanted to provide as a quick reference. Next slide, please. As shared earlier, the program is active and has already helped connect with over 580,000 tenants, provided le uh, limited legal services and tenant navigation to almost 13,000 households, and provided full scope legal representation to over 2,000 households. But more than just the numbers, we have seen the impact that the program has had on the lives of our residents across the county. For example, not too long ago, 
The 73-year-old tenant was illegally locked out by her landlord while being hospitalized for a stroke. Her son reached out to stay house delay after learning about the landlord's actions, and the program helped organize legal assistance to fight the lockout, which ultimately resulted in the lockout being lifted and the tenant was able to return to her home and recover safely. So this is just one story of many, and we plan to continue doing this great work with the ARP Investment Your Board has, has made. The infusion of ARP will increase our efforts by helping us provide outreach and education to at least an additional 100,000 tenants, delivering approximately 120 hours, 120 virtual or in-person Know Your Rights workshops, provide 4,000 tenants with navigation services, connect 2,000 tenants with limited scope legal services, and provide 1,200 tenants with full scope legal services, and provide up to $1 million in short-term rental assistance. Next slide, please. So as noted, the program is active, and for our tenants watching now and listening, you can connect with these services now by going to stayhousedla.org or calling 888-694-0040. In addition, DCBA's Tenant Protections Hotline is also available for both tenants and landlords and provides one-on-one -on -one counseling services on housing and tenant protections and connections to services. We could be reached at 800-593-8222. County residents can also schedule in-person, virtual, or telephone appointments through our website by going to dcba.lecounty.gov. So this concludes my presentation, but I would like to take a moment to thank you and your teams for your continued support of this critical program. To our CEO, Fiza Davenport, and her team for all their guidance and support. And finally, I'd like to thank my team and our 25 community-based and nonprofit legal service partners who make up Stay Health LA program and who fight day-to-day -day relentlessly to help our tenants. Thank you again, and available for any questions you may have. Excellent. Um, thank you both very much for the presentation. I, the set matter one is always really informative and helps us keep track of how far our American Rescue Plan dollars are going into our communities across the county. So thank you. Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you both to Dr. Scorza and to Director Rafael Carvajal. Um, happy that we're making progress with our uh, tranche of funding at, through ARP, and glad to see that that's moving quickly and more will be released uh, by September. But uh, I wanted to speak directly to Director Rafael Carvajal, who's been directing DCBA and actually been, I think, very pivotal in the COVID uh, response. So. I know you're, you're kind of a little humble there, but you've helped our community residents in so many ways, uh, expediting, uh, in fact, getting out a lot of small grants to people, but now showing us what your, what your work has been uh, enabling a lot of our, our uh, residents and tenants to stay in place. So keeping people housed, making sure they know their rights in their different languages and holding those uh, legal aid seminars throughout the county in different languages, I think is, is a good example of, of how LA County leads. So I really wanna commend you and your staff for that. But I know that the money that we receive, even though we, we spent about $12 million on ARP for this investment here in this particular area, um, we know that we're going to need a lot more, especially because we see other, uh, the state and count, the other uh, cities moving in a different direction. So how do we, how do we continue with our good work and how do we pivot uh, so that we, we let our residents know that we continue to provide the very much needed and vital services that they, that they need to count on and, and who have yet to be made aware of? How do we pivot to that? Uh -huh. Thank you, Supervisor, for, for your leadership on this, and thank you for the question, and uh, thank you for all the compliments. It's, it takes a village. Uh, I just stand here on the shoulders of so many people doing this great work, uh, but thank you for all that. Uh, well, as we know, even prior to the COVID emergency, LA County has, has had some of the highest percentages of rent burn tenants in the nation. Add to this the disproportionate impact of the pandemic, the continued increases in the cost of living, and you have a recipe for you know, continued growth and demand for these services. So currently the demand for this program is outpacing our available resources. Mm -hmm. So for the last two years, this program has been operated through the cobbling together of one-time dollars. And as you've noted, the use of ERAP funding um, that our friends at LACDA were able to acquire were very helpful. We've also used Measure H dollars in the past, uh, NCC dollars from the Affordable Housing Trust and one-time state funding. So to ensure that we continue to make, meet these needs, the program would benefit from uh, us helping identify some sustainable funding 
Um, not only will this help more residents, but it would also help our CPO partners uh, with the ability to recruit and retain staff. Now, you know, one-time funding comes with the added pressure of uncertainty for both existing and potential employees. And many potential employees won't apply or accept some of these jobs because they fear losing it once the funding is exhausted. So I will add that DCBA has submitted a proposal for ARP tranche two funding that can serve as a baseline uh, for the next two years. Uh, and if approved, this can help us create some stability for the program as we work closely with our CEO partners to identify uh, ongoing sustainable resources. Can I ask you what that amount would look like? So we asked for uh, $36 million uh, over two and a half year uh, period that is left on the ARP spending uh, plan. Um, so if that does come to fruition, uh, we could definitely put this into use and uh, definitely continue to support and continue to help more folks. Right. Well, one last uh, question for you, Rafael. I know in the past you've been able to provide, I know our office with specific information of how uh, program funding has been distributed. Can you provide that again to our to to us uh, by the formatted uh, way that you have done in the past by district? Can you do oh, that? No, absolutely. Uh, great, great question too, because data is critical to ensuring that our programs are effective and we're really helping the people we need to help. Um, so as I noted, the State House program brought together 25 nonprofit organizations on legal services, and not every one of those providers has always captured the service data in the same way. And for many, it's also been the first time that they've worked with the county in some of these projects. So we made some investments in this space, and I'm happy to report that in the next week or so, we'll be able to provide your board offices a dashboard that kind of outlines and highlights at a high level who we're serving and where we're serving them. Right. Uh, we've started to review the data, and it's showing us that all of our districts have highly vulnerable communities in need of the service. In addition, in reviewing the demographics, I've also it's also showing us that, that we are serving primarily working age Black and Latina women who earn less than 30% of AMI. These are the same folks who we all know were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So it is demonstrating that this program is helping the most in need. So once we finalize that, we'll make sure that we get that out to all of your offices as soon as possible. Great. Good. Well, we're, we're cheer, cheerleaders for what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you both. And thank you for the great work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to add to the accolades uh, to both of you, to Dr. Scorza, for the overview that you always bring to how these emergency funds are being used and the good that they're doing. And Director Carvajal, I mean, uh, three years ago when uh, I brought this motion to create Stay Housed LA, um, and MRT uh, was still here as the co-author, you know, we, we do a lot of motions and we have a lot of faith uh, as to what will happen next. Uh, but I have to say, I think I, I'm particularly grateful to you and all of those with whom you work for making this a reality. Because I honestly think um, I was going to ask you about the need for continuing and more stable sort of funding sources that um, Supervisor Solis asked. But my, my question to you is, do you have any initial insights about whether funding Stay Housed LA is creating a return, I guess we would say, on county investment? Um, kind of what, what can we say about it? Uh, well, well, first of all, thank you, Supervisor, and your team for championing all this and being one of the biggest advocates of this program. I appreciate all the help and guidance from you and your team on this program as well. That's a great question, specifically on, on Stay House. We haven't done that evaluation yet, but recently in our lessons learned report back that we submitted on July 25th, we do highlight some research in this space. Uh, so Stout, which is a globally uh, global advisory firm that specializes in investment banking, um, recently conducted a cost benefit analysis of providing a right to counsel program uh, for those facing evictions that would, if, would, if it would be potentially implemented uh, in LA County. Uh, they found that the right to condo own ordinance uh, and supporting programs not only make a substantial difference in the life of vulnerable tenants, but it also is a more cost effective approach. Uh, the study evaluated a proposed uh, format uh, for the program, and they found that every dollar invested in the program would generate returns of approximately $4.80 to the County of Los Angeles if actually implemented as recommended. The, uh, the study further estimates that an annual investment of approximately $47 million in a right to counsel program could result in approximately $227 million 
and cost savings to the county. So even though state house is not a right to council program, it is well positioned to serve as a foundation for one should your board decide to move forward in that direction and are likely to provide similar returns. Uh, thank you. Well, we, we've been talking actually for, you know, several years about the um, sort of unbalanced situation where people are constantly losing their housing uh, over, uh, sometimes it can be one huge medical expense and all the money goes. But uh, in a lot of situations, the you know, the rent has been raised where there are no limits on those raises. And it's kind of like, sorry, and bye-bye. And the amount of money that we invest in trying to rehouse people uh, rapidly or over the long term is so much more than what we've invested in keeping them in their housing and just is so much more sane for them and for us. So thank you so much for this work. I uh, will continue, of course, to support it. Uh, the, um, uh, the legal services that we provide are also very important because data does show that many, many more people stay in their housing when they're represented against an eviction notice than when they're not. And that makes a lot of sense, not only because I'm an attorney, but because, uh, you know, I walk into court and don't know what to do. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, what am I supposed to do to stay in my house? So that's a very important part of it, not the only important part. But uh, thank you for all the work you've done. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and, and I share your appreciation, uh, uh, Supervisor Kuehl, and I also appreciate some ARPA dollars. So I'm glad that we were able to receive those additional resources from the federal government to augment the good work that was already happening here in LA County. Uh, thank you again, Director Carbajal, Dr. Scorza, for your presentations. Uh, this yeah. was a receive and file colleagues, and so such will be the order. Moving on to agenda item A10, discussion and consideration of necessary actions related to declared outbreaks of infectious disease, in this case, monkeypox, um, which I hailed. We'll hear a presentation from Dr. Rita Singhal, our chief medical officer. Um, and I think Dr. Ferrer is available if we have additional questions. Good morning to you both. Dr. Singhal. Yeah, good morning. Thank you so much, Supervisor. And, and we are both here. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to just start with our appreciation uh, to all the board offices for your support as we sort of roll out now what is sort of robust uh, testing, therapeutics, and vaccination. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Singal to run through a pres short presentation on uh, the updates from what we presented to you last week. So uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Singal, I believe you're on. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. So happy to be with you today to provide uh, the update on monkeypox. So I'll go ahead and take my first slide. So a little bit on our situation um, currently. So the number of monkeypox cases continue to rise around the world and here in the United States. As of August 8th, there are 30,189 cases of monkeypox across more than 88 countries. This included nearly 9,000 confirmed cases in the United States from 48 states, including 1,310 cases in California. To date, there have been 647 cases of monkeypox identified in LA County, which is the number that we will be uh, releasing today, which is double the number of cases we had 10 days ago. Additionally, there have been 29 cases reported in Long Beach and four cases reported in Pasadena. The median age of monkeypox cases in LA County remains at 35 years of age. We do now have one case below 18 years of age, which is in addition to the pediatric case reported in Long Beach last week. Only about 30% of cases report domestic or international travel, indicating that majority of the cases are now from local transmission. There have been 12 hospitalizations among persons with monkeypox. Most of these have been due to minor complications from monkeypox or to treat pain. Internationally, there have been four deaths due to monkeypox in countries outside of where it is endemic. However, there have been no deaths in LA County or nationally. Next slide, please. Public Health continues to track the demographic and geographic profile of monkeypox cases in LA County. 
This dashboard is live on our website and is updated every Friday. The profile of cases in LA County continues to align with what is being seen across the country and the world. As of August 5th, 99% of monkeypox cases in LA County were male and over 85% reported a sexual orientation as gay or bisexual. Additionally, 38% of the monkeypox cases were white, 34% Latinx, 11% black, and 5% Asian. Next slide, please. Geographically, just over half of our cases are in service planning area or SPA 4, which is the metro region, which is shown on the map as the dark purple. 15% of our cases are in service planning area 2 or the San Fernando Valley, which is shown in blue. The remaining service planning areas have less than 10% of cases each, with SPA 1 and 3 having the fewest cases. I want to emphasize that the risk of monkeypox in the general population remains low. Our public health community and field services teams continue to investigate cases and conduct contact tracing to learn more about how widespread the virus is in our community. Next slide. We encourage anyone in the public who thinks they may have monkeypox to contact their healthcare provider for evaluation. Most healthcare providers in Los Angeles can test for monkeypox by collecting samples from lesions on the skin and sending them to either one of several commercial labs that are now accepting samples or to the public health's public health laboratory. To date, our public health laboratory has conducted testing for over 350 suspect cases and will continue to provide testing for priority patients and providers who are unable to send specimens to commercial labs. Patients without a health care provider or health insurance can call 211 for a referral, or they can visit a public health sexual health clinic. All of our sexual health clinics are providing evaluation and testing for monkeypox. Next slide, please. To move to vaccine now, so public health is continuing to be aggressive in our vaccination efforts. As a reminder, the federal supply of monkeypox vaccine remains limited. The public health priority is to administer first doses of vaccine to as many people who are at higher risk for monkeypox as possible. When the vaccine supply improves, public health will make second doses available. To date, we have received just over 43,000 doses of the Genius vaccine. This includes about 24,000 doses received in phases one and two, and about 19,000 doses in tranche one of phase three. Of these 43,290 doses, as of 4 p.m. yesterday, almost 41,000 doses have been distributed to vaccination sites across the county, from public health pods and clinics to community partners and hospitals, our correctional health services, and our city public health departments. Of the 41,000 doses distributed, 28,330 doses have been administered, and 12,668 doses are pending administration. Over 20,000 of the vaccines administered were provided at public health locations, either at our vaccination pods or at public health clinics. In addition to public health vaccination sites, we have community pods in West Hollywood and Silver Lake that began vaccinating last week, and we have two more pop-up sites opening this week in Hollywood. Together, we expect 4,600 doses to be administered at these locations by Friday this week. 10,285 doses have been distributed to over 40 community clinic providers and hospitals, of which 57% of doses have been administered. We are continually working with these providers to address challenges, assess administration data, and redistribute doses accordingly. Our Corrections Health Services continues to vaccinate those eligible in jails, and we have provided doses to both city health departments for vaccine administration within their jurisdiction. Last, we've allocated 1,500 doses for persons experiencing homelessness or PEH and other vulnerable populations. More detail on how we are working with these groups will be provided a little later in this presentation. Overall, we've administered 65% of the doses LA County has received. The goal is to administer the majority of the remaining doses by Sunday, holding only a small number of vaccines for newly identified high and intermediate risk close contacts. A little bit on future doses. So tranche two of phase three will be available to us to order on Monday, August 15th. Tranche two is about 30% of our phase three doses, 
which is equivalent to 14,436 doses. The last tranche of phase three is another 14,436 doses, which will be available to us once we have administered 90% of our doses received. Also, I want to address a new development regarding an alternate dosing regimen with the Genios vaccine. So the White House announced today that FDA has approved a dosing regimen that will use a smaller dose of the vaccine and be administered intradermally instead of intramuscular. This approval was based on scientific evidence that this alternate, alternate regimen produces a similar immune response as the current vaccine approach. We are awaiting additional information and instructions from CDC and hope to implement once our clinical providers are trained. This alternate regimen has the potential to expand our vaccine allocation by five times. Lastly, I can provide an update on the state's vaccine administration platform, My Turn. We have been working with the state for the last couple of months to have them add the monkeypox module to the My Turn system so doses administered can be recorded there. This has taken time. However, we have received information from the state that they will be rolling it out in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, all providers have been using the REDCap system to document their administration data, which we are mandated to collect. Public Health holds weekly meetings with clinical providers to provide technical assistance. It is strongly encouraged that clinical providers who are administering the monkeypox vaccine attend these meetings so that they are hearing the latest information and getting assistance as needed. Next slide. In an effort to simplify the eligibility for the monkeypox vaccine, Public Health did expand and change their criteria last week. The monkeypox vaccine is now available to gay or bisexual men and transgender persons 18 years of age and older who have had multiple or anonymous sex partners in the last 14 days, including engaging in survival or transactional sex. Residents who met prior eligibility criteria are still eligible for vaccination, and this includes gay or bisexual men or transgender persons who were diagnosed with gonorrhea or early syphilis within the past 12 months, are on HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, or attended or worked at a commercial sex venue or other venue where they had anonymous sex or sex with multiple partners. In addition, we are prioritizing residents who are immunocompromised, including those that have advanced or uncontrolled HIV, as they may be at higher risk for severe disease. Additionally, residents who do not have access to the internet or need assistance with vaccine access can now call our public health call center at 833-540-0473. We have staff available seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. in multiple languages. Next slide, please. We continue to encourage residents who are eligible for the vaccine to contact their healthcare provider to find out if they are a monkeypox vaccine provider. Residents who are eligible and are also able to pre-register to get vaccinated through public health and community pod sites. As monkeypox vaccine doses become available, the pre-registration link is opened and when capacity is reached, it is paused. Residents can subscribe to our monkeypox newsletter on our monkeypox website to be notified when pre-registration is open. I'm happy to announce that the registration portal was open this morning and we are currently taking registrations. Those registered will receive a text message from public health inviting them to be vaccinated over the next one to two days. Please do not call or show up at monkeypox vaccination clinics or public walk-up sites without having a personal text message from public health as this is required proof of verification. Additionally, public health is communicating directly with a number of groups to provide vaccination, including people who have had high or intermediate risk contact with someone with monkeypox and people who attended an event or venue where there was a high risk exposure. Public health is also working with clinical staff in the LA County jail system to provide vaccines to people in high risk cohorts. And we're working with partners to provide information and vaccines to people experiencing homelessness and high risk populations identified through community based organizations. Next slide, please. A little more on these partnerships. So over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, public health formed strong partnerships with a number of community and faith based organizations to share resources and information and to provide easy access to vaccine. And we are emulating the same model for the monkeypox response. 
We are holding telebriefing calls with our community-based and faith-based partners to provide a situational update on monkeypox and the vaccine effort and to answer any questions they may have. And as I've mentioned during previous meetings, Public Health has nearly 100,000 printed materials about monkeypox that we are making available to our community and faith-based partners. We're also working with a number of partners to provide vaccines to the most vulnerable through mobile vaccine events and have set aside nearly 500 doses for these events, many of which are close to being finalized and we'll be happy to share more information once they are confirmed. We're also holding telebriefing calls with our PEH providers and interim housing partners to provide the same information and resources. We've created a PEH specific pocket card in English and Spanish that we are supplying to outreach teams. And finally, nearly 30 providers have committed to provide vaccines to PEH. Providers include federally qualified centers, mobile vaccine teams, and other community partners. While this effort just recently got off the ground, we do expect to administer nearly 1,000 doses by the end of this week. I will note that our own DPH mobile vaccine teams have 12 vaccination events scheduled this week for PEH. Next slide. Finally, um, a little bit on our communications. So our communications team continues to provide information about monkeypox through a variety of strategies, and I'd like to provide you a few of those updates. We received feedback from numerous partners that the communities impacted the most in the monkeypox outbreak get most of their information on social media. During our last meeting several weeks ago, I mentioned that our team built out a robust message ambassador list of local LGBTQ creators, artists, and personalities to provide information on these channels. Our team has also shared a variety of monkeypox assets on our own channels, which to date have received have reached more than 1.1 million residents in LA County. Additionally, our monkeypox newsletter has reached more has reached more than 10,000 subscriptions, and we continue to share information weekly about vaccine eligibility, signs and symptoms, and ways residents can protect themselves. Our team has also spoken with nearly a dozen media partners conducting interviews about monkeypox in English and Spanish, and we're continuing to pitch our media partners for additional interviews about monkeypox to traditional and ethnic media outlets. And as I've mentioned before, our monkeypox public health call center is now live and we're working to promote the call center. Residents can call the number 833-540-0473 to get information about testing, vaccine eligibility, or general information about monkeypox. Thank you, and happy to take some questions. Thank you. A quick clarifying question. Um, is the pre-registration vaccination link, has it, I understood that it was at capacity and was paused. Is that still the case? I can provide some information on that. So the way that our registration portal works is that we open it up and we take a certain amount of registrations based on the number of vaccines that we feel we can deliver at our public health vaccination sites and now our community sites as well, the community pods. And then we do send out those messages over the next few days. And what we will do is what this means is that the registration portal will open and then pause. So it will close and then it will open again once we can um, reevaluate and redistribute doses, and we find that we do have more doses, we do have more um, capacity at our publication, public vaccination sites, and we can open up the portal again. And for example, that is what today is. So today we did we did reassess yesterday where we are with our vaccine doses, and we are able to uh, 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 determine that we have several thousand doses that we can give out at our public vaccination sites this week. So we are opening up the portal again. We will take a certain amount of registrations for the folks that we feel that we can provide vaccine to this week. So once we reach that limit, the portal will close. We will then send out invitations to those folks that are on the list, and then we will continue re continually reevaluate. So if we feel like we do have more um, doses that can be redistributed from partners that may not be able to use the doses this week, then we will again open up the portal, take more registrations, and, um, and send out more invitations. Thank you for that. Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Dr. Freer and, and, and Dr. Uh, Singal. I really appreciate the information you're giving us today, and I like the way that it's crisp, concise, 
and very much to the point. So congratulations on that. And the fact that you have the call center number up, I'm assuming that's also available in different languages. So you're able to get to yep. different folks. So just one, you know, quick question also regarding uh, the fact that, for example, community hospitals sites on one of your, your slides, you're showing that they were, uh, they received over 10,000 uh, vaccines and doses that have been administered is about half, a little bit more than half, 5,800, but then 4,400 are, are still pending. I'm wondering when does your staff make an analysis if they do to see if we can pull those back? Because as it stands right now, I think in some ways you guys are doing a great job because our pop-ups, you just opened one up at Barnes, Barnsdale Park in my district and it's already booked. <laughs> so I'm wondering what is your, your uh, plan B to try to claw back some of those uh, vaccines and how do we do it in a manner that's very timely? Yeah, I think it's it's a great question. And, and first, I, I do want to appreciate all of our providers. And we absolutely can't do this without the support from the providers, uh, our community providers. And, you know, they, uh, they may go a little bit slower, Supervisor Solis, as you know, most of them are going uh, through an appointment system. And many of them are sort of reaching out uh, to their patients to try to bring them in which is a very important role that we actually can't play. So uh, our providers are in touch with their patients, many of whom uh, they may have a trusted relationship with, many of whom they're gonna be willing to ask questions uh, and get answers from that provider, but it might take a little bit longer. Uh, but when I say a little bit longer, right now we've, ex we've really been uh, you know, very direct with the providers, the goal is always to get all of the doses we have, or you know, with leaving very little for sort of the emergency situations, uh, really into people's arms within 10 days of the distribution. And that will take us till Sunday. If we see during the week that some providers are not able to get their doses out, we talk with those providers because we want them to stay in our network. Right. Uh, what we've said to folks is, if you don't think you're gonna use them, you can give them back to us, we can redistribute. And then next week, because we're gonna get another shipment next week, uh, we will get more doses back out to the providers. But we do respect that the providers are setting up appointments uh, with their patients and need a little bit more time uh, to actually get those appointments made and to bring people in, then it takes us at our pod. So we're trying to balance both uh, recognizing the important role that providers have in reaching some of the folks who may not uh, be coming into our public sites. Right. So, and and for the city of Long Beach, it's almost the same, you know, question. I know there's a great need there, but I'm surprised that uh, pending administration is over 2,000 and they were given 3,000. So just wondering, you know, maybe folks aren't fully aware of what's going on on the ground out there. I, you know, again, I, I think, you know, Long Beach is working hard with also, you know, they have their community providers as well that they're trying to distribute to so that we bring people in both through the public side, the public clinics, as well as through private providers mm -hmm. um, to get vaccinated. But again, Long Beach is all of the providers know that if you're not going to be able to use them by the end of this week to please give them back so we can redistribute them. Right, right. Thank you for that. One last question. Just something that kind of dawned on me is that there's a lot of confusion about what what this is, monkeypox, because if you have a rash or if you have maybe shingles um, or, or if you have herpes, uh, how, how are we informing our community to help differentiate? Because I'm sensing that in some ways there, there are language barriers and cultural barriers. And I believe that it could be underreported in, in immigrant communities, especially the Latino community. And uh, can you give me some maybe insight on, on what we can do to help highlight and provide better information so people can not wait and think, oh, it's just shingles, but maybe it really isn't. And, you know, they're not really aware of what to look for because the information that's being published or put on out in the media is somewhat confusing, I have to say, um, as a layperson. So can you shed some light on that, please? I think it's a great question. Um, I'm gonna let Dr. Singal talk about all the efforts that we have with the provider community, because that's a big part of it. Um, for people who have a new or unusual rash, they always need to see a provider to get that rash evaluated. 
And I want to note that most rashes that uh, most of us have are not going to be monkeypox. In order for you to get monkeypox, uh, you had to have had an exposure. And it's not, you know, monkeypox isn't floating around in the air. So it's a direct, you know, sort of close contact, uh, in some cases, intimate contact exposure uh, that would allow for that easy uh, transmission of this virus. It's, it's very different than coronavirus. Uh, but we do always want to make sure that people have a new rash, a rash that they've not seen before, a rash that they have no experience with. This is the time to make sure you, you're getting that rash evaluated. And that holds for, you know, for forever. You know, new rashes that people uh, see or get, um, they themselves or their children need to be evaluated. Um, and that's in part why I'm going to ask Dr. Singal to talk about the provider communications, because that's where it's critically important as well uh, that provider, providers understand how to do the screenings and the testing uh, when appropriate for monkeypox. Yes, absolutely. So we have held a series of webinars with clinical providers around the county. And in those webinars and in those trainings, we are basically providing kind of side by side pictures and, you know, just tips on how to differentiate the monkeypox rash from other rashes. Um, there's also, I think, a key component of this that Dr. Fur also mentioned, which is that getting a really good history on any sort of exposures or risks, which will really help the providers to identify if this is something that they should consider monkeypox for. Um, and now that, you know, testing is available more broadly, there, we're encouraging providers that if there is any question that this may be monkeypox, that they do go ahead and test. But we have been providing kind of, um, you know, we, there, there's resources available from CDC and from other places as well on, for providers to be able to differentiate rashes, you know, uh, the monkeypox one from others. And that is something that we're definitely pushing out and including in our communication with providers. Good. So thank you. I, I really want to encourage you to do that because I do think there can be that confusion. And just putting it out in their languages is going to be very helpful. And to know that if you have a rash, go see your doctor, go see your provider. I think that message really has to be stated over and over again. So again, thank you both. And thank you for uh, providing the pop-ups in our district. And I know as the vaccines come in, there's going to be more availability. So thank you both and your staffs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Singal and uh, Dr. Ferrer. I have a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, could you clarify again what you said about second doses? Because where the vaccine is limited, we, I kind of wanted to understand what um, the approach was. Yeah, Dr. Singal, do you want to, it's, it's a little complicated now because we're in a transition with uh, the new uh, EUA from the FDA um, that will allow us actually to do a better job on second doses. But I'm going to let Dr. Singal sort of walk us through that. Sure, absolutely. So uh, as we know, it, um, Genius vaccine is FDA approved as a two dose series. The two doses are supposed to be given 28 days apart. Um, however, given this current supply and the current kind of need and demand to get folks vaccinated, we, along with other jurisdictions, we did get direction from um, the state, for example, have put out a statement stating that we will be prioritizing first doses. And what that means is that we're going to be providing the first dose to as many folks as we can. And then as more doses become available, we will then provide the second dose. Now, that being said, we do have a caveat in there for those that are immunosuppressed. They do need that second dose. And so we are, um, we have communicated with our providers that if you do have those, um, those patients that are immunocompromised, that we should you know, give them the second dose within the 28 days um, interval. Now, with this new alternate regimen, right, that, it, that we have just gotten um, notice about, we will now have five times the number of doses. And so with this, it would expand our capacity um, a, a, a good amount that we could provide that second dose sooner. And so it may be as soon as once we get the doses um, in tranche two and tranche three, which are the two kind of remaining buckets of doses that we're going to be receiving this month, that we would have capacity at that point to start providing the second doses. But essentially, we will be continuing to prior prioritize first doses um, and until this new strategy goes into effect. And then we will provide second doses once more doses are available. 
So in the in the packaging of doses, uh, do uh, do they come packaged as one dose, or does it come packaged as more than one dose so that uh, those who are administering doses have to measure anyway? Because I'm trying to figure out how we transition to the smaller dose so that everybody knows, you know, in here there's now five or whatever. So right now it's single vial doses. So currently we use one vial for one dose of what we administer. Um, with the new regimen, it will be, we, we're waiting for the guidance. So it, it, there will be documents, you know, clinical considerations and guidance documents that will come from CDC and the FDA. Uh, what we are assuming is going to be that now we will need to extract five doses per vial. And so that is going to require training with our providers. Um, for most folks that do vaccinate, it's not something that's new. We have done it with COVID vaccine. We do do it with other vaccines as well, because there are multiple dose vials for other vaccines. And so we will just be training um, our providers and our own teams in public health on what that extraction of the five doses looks like. The other difference will be is how it's administered. So instead of an intramuscular injection, it'd be an intradermal. And again, you know, the nurses that do the vaccination, they're they're well equipped to do an intradermal versus an intramuscular. We will provide that training again just to confirm. But it is not the only um, you know vaccine or or kind of administration that is hap that would be happening intradermal. So, you know, we do feel like it's going to require some time for us to to you know work with providers to make sure that they are. Um, comfortable doing this, uh, but we don't feel that it's something that should be a huge challenge or barrier. So the intradermal is also uh, efficacious for the second dose. Is that correct? Yes. So we. So what we're hearing. So again, we have not received this. You know, once we have the written uh, clinical considerations and guidance, we can confirm this. But what we are hearing is that the intradermal smaller dose can be used as a second dose for those that got a full dose intramuscular first dose. That makes so sense. So looking at sort of the other side of it, where what we're saying is we're we're getting limited supplies, but we now are getting authority to use them uh, in a much more efficient way so that we get five Absolutely. for one. Is there any information about additional manufacturing or uh, manufacturers in the world? I have not heard anything more about additional manufacturers. What we are waiting to hear from CDC is when the next doses beyond phase three will come. And so we had originally heard later fall. Um, now we're hearing possibly September, October, which would be great. But the number of doses in this next phase would be a lot smaller than what we have received in phase three. Uh, so the other uh, clarification I wanted to ask for and about, um, relates to the the uh, population that's identified as being um, eligible for the vaccine seems to primarily be related to those who've had sexual activity of some kind. Um, but you should say, oh no, in addition, there are these following categories, if there are. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, a supervisor. I mean, the we've always been clear that monkeypox, um, as we're seeing it now, is spread with this very close contact. Most of the information we have indicates that for many people, that very close contact is associated with sexual activity, but not exclusively. So again, our materials are very clear that there are other routes of transmission of monkeypox that we need to pay attention to. Uh, one of the other routes is obviously um, shared towels, sheets, clothing. Um, the transmission really is for people who have lesions and are sort of then using a towel and then somebody else comes along and uses that towel. There's a possibility that you can go ahead and transmit the virus through those shared that shared towel, the shared clothing, the shared sheets and bedding. This is a particular importance for household contacts. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I want to note that as part of our contact tracing, we're always looking at household contacts, offering them obviously an opportunity to get vaccinated, but also giving them education about signs and symptoms that they should be looking for over what can be a relatively longer incubation period. 
there's also, you know, known sort of, I would, I'm going to call this non-sexual. It can be sexual in nature, but people who are kissing, um, and that again can be household members. Somebody has sores in their mouth. Uh, there's a possibility with respiratory droplets trying to obviously learn more about that. Um, that can again increase the likelihood that there's going to be transmission and close contact over a prolonged period, face-to-face -face contact, when uh, does allow for transmission through respiratory droplets. That is not primarily what we're seeing, but we're certainly encouraging, um, for example, uh, uh, personal care attendants to keep those masks on. Um, as well as obviously follow a lot of care around uh, hygiene with towels and sheets and bedding um, and noting uh, when if people are coming in with rashes, what are the precautions that need to be taken. So I don't want anybody to think the only route of transmission is sort of sexual conduct, uh, a sexual contact, because that would be false uh, given what we know. I think there is some, you know, there are some people looking to further our understanding about, particularly around respiratory droplets, how likely is that? Um, but for now, because there's a long history of monkeypox in Africa, we do have a lot of information about how the virus can be transmitted. And I, I wanna urge folks, if you think you may have monkeypox or have been exposed to monkeypox, you do need to talk to a provider or call us so that we can give you some more information, you can get tested, and we can help identify your close contacts um, so that if you're a possible monkeypox case or you're a confirmed monkeypox case, we're again trying to limit spread. I don't know, Dr. Singal, if you there's anything you want to add as well. I mean, we work a lot with the providers on this, you know, to help us. Uh, because when, when they have patients coming in who have a possibility of having monkeypox, that's at the point that the education has to start and the identification of any close contacts uh, also has to begin uh, for people who are likely to have monkeypox. We don't really want to wait the three days it might take to get that positive test result to start that education. Well, uh, the reason I brought it up is because I think there's a, uh, in some places, a, a misunderstanding about whether this is a sexually transmitted infection. And so people feel safe where I think they shouldn't. I don't know, for instance, about people who come to clean someone's house. Mm -hmm. I think they are already very aware because of COVID that they need to be on guard all the time. Uh, and I, but I'm thinking in our communication and I'm, it looked to me like we were doing that, but in our communication, I think we should constantly make it clear in every language and in every community this is not only right. sexually transmitted infection. This is an infection that can be transmitted by any kind of close contact, hugging, you know, or, uh, you know, even cleaning someone's house and having to deal with their sheets and towels. Something that is more broad so that people continue to be on guard. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Barger. Thank you. And, and actually, um, uh, Supervisor Kuehl uh, clarified my question regarding the second dosage because I was a little confused as well. But on the contact tracing, are we using the same methodology and the same, for lack of a better term, resources that we did for um, COVID? Because I know that, um, Dr. Perry, you said that the cases are increasing more rapidly, making contact tracing a little more difficult. So are we incorporating the same methodology um, to get out there and do the contact tracing? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Thanks so much, Supervisor Barger. Um, and, and we're glad that we've, we've got very experienced contact tracers. Um, I, I will note a couple of, of changes that have been made. One is the initial case interview uh, is happening by nurses because it's rather complicated uh, and it's also lengthy. Um, and then we're using our contact tracers who have had a lot of training to help us uh, really find the close contacts, uh, give them good education, uh, talk with them, connect with them. Uh, and so far we've been able with the staff that we have to keep up. But obviously we're planning for the future 
when in fact that may be much more difficult, um, just depending on what the growth rate is uh, in new cases. Um, you know, sort of a doubling of cases every 10 days, you know, you could just do the math and see how quickly uh, this becomes uh, a difficult task with these lengthy, with this lengthy interview that needs to happen with all of the cases. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Singal, cause she's been working super hard with our team. Uh, we also put in a request obviously to the state and we're negotiating on getting some additional support from the state as we speak today and tomorrow uh, to help us. But I'll let Dr. Singal talk about sort of how we're gonna move into the future. Right now we're keeping up, but we have to be prepared for having many more cases. Yes, absolutely. So I think um, there are some differences between the contact tracing for monkeypox versus COVID, for example. Um, in addition to the initial case interview, even following up with contacts, there is a component of offering them the vaccine as a post-exposure prophylaxis, and that's part of the close contacts that we at Public Health manage. And so, you know, we do have a pretty good system down now on how they're referred for that vaccine. Um, and so that is something that we can now shift and involve other uh, staff in public health to do. And so that is where contact tracers will come in and can now help with those pieces of it. I think looking forward, we are continuing to evaluate the case interview to see if there's any changes that can be made to shorten it. This is something that it is mandated information that we need to report up to the state as well as to CDC. So continue to have conversations with them as we learn more about the current outbreak, what is the most important information that is helping us that we're using and acting on. And so that's, for example, something that we'll be looking at We'll also be moving towards using a um, text message system to keep in touch with cases and with contacts. So to follow up and say, hey, how are you doing? Do you need any help with anything? Um, you know, they have our, we have a public health nurse that gets assigned to each case. And so they will have that person's number. So if they need to contact them with any needs, but for future contacts, we may not be able to call them every day or every week. We will use a text messaging system to stay in contact with them to make sure that they, if there are any needs, you know, if they've been hospitalized, if they need the treatment, for example, that we can then help navigate and get that for them. So that's another example of something that we're working on to make sure that we can um, you know, we can keep up. And then I think the, the third thing that I can mention is that there are um, apps that are being used in other jurisdictions where cases can notify their contacts directly and anonymously. And so that is something that we'll also look into to see if that's something that we can do to help us with the contact tracing and to get that done quickly um, versus having, you know, kind of a team that needs to call them back. We will still do that, you know, especially for those that are difficult to, to reach. But, you know, that is another piece that we want to look at and make sure that we um, can implement if we feel that it, it's going to work for our communities. Excellent. Thank you that for that. And then I'll just say in closing, you know, it's interesting and, and Sergeant Kuhl touched on it in terms of um, what people think are fact and what are what are in fact fiction. For example, over the weekend, I was talking to someone who thought if you have the chicken pox vaccination, that you are protected from um, being exposed to monkey pox. Um, and, you know, and I tried to explain no, and it's just like shingles, you can be vaccinated, but you know, it's part of the same family. And it, while you're not guaranteed to get it, you are more vulnerable, even if you're vaccinated. So I think it's important for us to get it out, the word, um, even in terms of how it's transmitted to, to what Spencer Kuhl was talking about, because there is a misconception and a false sense of security by people thinking that, well, either I'm vaccinated, so I'm fine, or, you know, I, I didn't come in, uh, have sexual contact, therefore I'm okay. Um, and I, so I think it's important for us to to continue to to really drive home um, the fact versus fiction in terms of of how you can contract um, um, or uh, be exposed to this uh, to monkeypox. But thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Barger, um, and uh, l let me thank both of you um, for your work. I think you know with this presentation, as with all your others, it's it's so apparent that this, the work you do at public health is so deeply layered. And while in these presentations, we get a sense of the surface level, you know, the work that you all are doing, as you said, you know, in your negotiations with the state to try to get additional resources to help with the outreach. So we appreciate your work, uh, your commitment to the residents of the county. Supervisor Solis. 
Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I, I forgot to ask Dr. Ferrer and, and Dr. Singal about the young child that uh, developed. There was, there was a case in L.A. County. Yeah, there, there are two pediatric cases, and, uh, you know, we really give out no information about the pediatric cases. I mean, I can just say that, um, you know, those, uh, those cases and their families are getting all the support and services that they need. But we don't, you know, with, with pediatric cases, we're especially sensitive about uh, making sure that we protect everyone's privacy. So, um, so we're acknowledging when we have pediatric cases uh, but again, uh, not providing any additional details. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course. Any other questions before we move on in our agenda? Hearing no other comments, the report is received and filed. Uh, and I'm going to um, um, read in a motion that will allow us, quite frankly, members to include a monkeypox update in our regular standing item um, agenda. We've had to do it separately under agenda item A10, so we're going to try to centralize this process. So the read-in motion is as follows. In light of the declared state and local emergencies related to monkeypox and the monkeypox vaccine, I move that the Board of Supervisors direct the Executive Officer of the Board to add an update on monkeypox to the reoccurring set matter on the public health order related to COVID-19. Uh, I will move the agenda item, seconded by Supervisor Solis. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you to the two of you for your presentations today. Moving on to item four, implementing the priority strategies of the equity and county contracting project team, which I held. Uh, colleagues, this motion is a follow-up motion to the equity and county contracting motion. I co-authored with Supervisor Kuehl in April of 2021. The county itself is the largest purchaser of goods and services in LA County at over $6 billion in purchases annually. County purchases, also known as procurement, can have a substantial impact on the, on the success of a small business, especially those owned by underrepresented groups of people. Uh, since our motion last April, there's been over a year-long process of deep community engagement and problem solving in which community-based organizations, county leaders, and other stakeholders have come together to identify issues with our procurement systems and elevate solutions informed by those closest to the challenges. Today's motion directs the county to tackle some of the greatest barriers that small employers face to accessing county contracts, such as expanding our prompt payment program to ensure that all of our contractors are able to keep their businesses open and running, and establishing a revolving loan fund to support community-based organizations and small businesses with prohibitive startup costs for contracts. The motion also establishes a centralized office of contracting and procurement to institutionalize best practices and to continue the ongoing improvement process of building an equitable contracting system. As we are permanently codifying the county's goal of ensuring 25% of contracts go to small business and 3% of contracts are awarded to disabled veteran business enterprises. We could not have done this without the years of work by our Small Business Commission and Office of Small Business. With today's motion, we are one step closer, closer to ensuring that our small employers get an equitable market share of the over $6 billion in contracts. Like the motion we brought forward two weeks ago, which established an anti-displacement program for small businesses, this motion aims to level the playing field, provide opportunities for small employers to build wealth, expand their operation, and ultimately strengthen the capacity of our community uh, partners. Colleagues, I ask for your I vote would like to ask uh, my co-author, Supervisor Kuehl, if you'd like to provide some remarks. I always like to provide some remarks. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to join with you in this motion to bring 
you know, continue to attempt to bring some real equity into our Los Angeles County uh, contracting. I've been really pleased to be part of this priority dating back a handful of years and really grateful that you're pushing it to the next level, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the motion acknowledges that there can be no equity in contracting uh, with the county until significant barriers are removed. And we want to be very earnest and sincere about doing this in a way that really works for our small businesses. Because any legitimate organization, nonprofits, community-based organizations, large and small, but particularly those small, will be shown the front door, will be given this point of entry. Uh, and it's a door to which our larger contractors may already have the key. Uh, and speaking of key, there's a couple of things I, I just wanted to suggest, should this motion pass, uh, in terms of c keeping up our commitment about really doing this. Um, many small organizations just do not have the staff to fill out all these papers, to get all the information, you know, to do it. So we have been talking about providing technical assistance. And even in the case of the funds uh, that we've allocated that we used to call Measure J funds, but, um, you know, they're really the commitment that we made to using NCC for local organizations. Um, Songhai has been doing an incubator for those organizations that is specifically about bringing them kind of along on being professional about accessing our uh, contracting applications and you know it, and issues and processes. So I wanted simply to put in sort of verbally, not necessarily in the motion, that part of really removing these barriers has to do with supplying some help. Either these incubators, which I heard back from a couple of small nonprofits, they loved it. I mean, even though we all look like the Muppets, you know, when we get together on those Zoom calls, there's a lot of sort of interaction about at questions and answers and uh, any kind of technical assistance. So I'm very happy to co-author. Thank you so much for uh, bringing the motion. And I look forward to the work we'll do together to make it real. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? I would just say in response, I completely agree with you, Supervisor Kuehl. I, you know, I think it's twofold. It's, it's government, county government, all levels of, of government really looking honestly internally about why our level of bureaucracy is, is the level it is in terms of true relationships with small employers. When I think back to Supervisor Solis's motions on um, improving access to faith-based organizations, it's really twofold, making sure that we open up our processes so they have access and shoring up the infrastructure of our small employer community, either faith-based, community-based organizations, or small employers. Having run nonprofits, both teeny tiny and really big, uh, I know the challenge, um, even when you have a solid infrastructure running a community-based organization and managing government contracts, it can be unnecessarily overwhelming in my opinion. So that's why I think these motions are so important and um, I appreciate you supporting this uh, motion with me. So hearing no other comments, item four is before us. I will move, ask that Supervisor Kuehl second to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item four is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Verizon Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you. Item 10, establishing our commitment to the Los Angeles City County Native American Indian Commission, which was held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just wanted to go over a few, a few uh, items. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure if everyone in Los Angeles County knows that the Los Angeles County Native American Indian Commission has existed for the last 46 years. That was a factoid, I think, that a lot of people, it just gets lost on them. They're not really fully aware how the county has really been committed. Uh, this organization, uh, LANAC for short, was created through a joint effort of members of the Los Angeles Native American community, as well as the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles. And you know, the commission was established 
in in a in a very historic manner because it was the first of its kind in the entire country, the United States. Can can you believe that? That's another good fact. And its primary purpose was to increase the acquisition and application of funding resources to address the socioeconomic problems of the cities and the counties, American Indian and Alaskan Native communities. However, as you know, our board and our county's vision for equity and anti-racism has expanded recently, and that has also helped, I think, to support the work of the commission. The LANEC has recently worked to combat the systemic and structural erasure of Native American and Alaskan Native histories and culture in partnership with our Department of Arts and Culture, which has leaned into its mission and a vision for cultural equity, as we all know. The work includes celebrating, as an example, our county's inaugural Indigenous Peoples Day that we started back in 2018 with the removal of the Christopher Columbus statue at Grand Park. Some of you might well remember that, as well as hiring a tribal engagement facilitator to gather input on the ways our county has harmed local tribal nations in an effort to advance truth, healing, and transformation and to develop a proposal for land acknowledgement and land access policies and protocols. While we know these actions are laudable, we know that the county must do better in improving the health and overall well-being of all Native peoples. This could be done, in my opinion, effectively by transferring the, La the LANIAC to the Department of Arts and Culture as a new placement for administrative and operational support. With that opportunity, we hope this will be a very good strategic partnership. <clears throat> the LANIC and our Department of Arts and Culture, as you know, have fostered a strong partnership and have developed ways for Native peoples to share their history and culture and provide in insight into some of the most challenging situations that our county faces. We've seen the issues related to recent transition of the LANIAC from our former WEDAX department to the executive office. And this motion seeks to rectify that and have the executive director of LANIAC, the director of the Department of Arts and Culture, and our executive officer report back in fiscal year 22-23 supplemental budget phase on transfer and the necessary funding and staffing to LANIAC so that they are appropriately resourced to carry out the board's direction and serve our Native American and Alaskan Native communities. Colleagues, I respectfully ask for your I vote, and I am very tremendously honored for all the people that called in today that want to see this happen. This was not an idea that came from my office. It was an idea that came from the commissioners and from the community. So I ask that you please support this motion. My co-author, as you know, is not available, but she's here in spirit with us, and that's Janice Hahn, who also represents a very large Native American community. So with that, Madam Chair, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, and Supervisor Lise, for the motion, and I um, look forward to absolutely supporting it. I do have a question for the CEO, because I think uh, I'm looking forward to the report back on this, because we want to make sure, even frankly, that the Department of Arts and Culture is appropriately resourced to meaningly, meaningfully support the commission. But my question for um, the CEO is that a, a number of our commissions have raised concerns about um, lacking the necessary administrative, legal, grant writing, or other types of administrative support. And so I just want to know how we go about doing a review to, to make the assessment about whether commissions are getting the support they need to be effective and, and truly functioning in the county. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell, for the question. Um, you know, we can certainly work with the executive office on that analysis and uh, come back to the board recommendations. What we would be uh, focusing on are administrative issues, legal issues, staffing issues, things of that nature. Uh, we have over 200 commissions in the county, uh, so we'd be looking to the executive office and maybe some of our departments that staff the commissions for recommendations on commissions who um, either are uniquely situated, let's say they operate a program or they do a lot of outreach, to really look at those commissions to see what uh, staffing levels are appropriate, what funding support is appropriate, and uh, 
My rough estimate supervisors right now um, is about 90 days to do that analysis, but we want to take our lead from the executive office and the departments. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, I was have to tell you how surprised I was to f learn of that 200 number when I joined the board. Um, and again, really wanting to make sure that, that, that we understand what their needs are, because like you said they're all very different, have different, you know, kind of statutory functions. So making sure that we don't have to approach it as a one-off, given that there are 200 of them, and that we're being thoughtful that while they were transferred into one department, you know, making sure that all of the resources are needed to follow them so they're effective. So thank you um, for that, and I look forward to that information. Any other questions or comments? Madam Chair, Dr. thank you for that question. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you for that question. I think it's very uh, important to ask that question because, in fact, this particular commission has received in the past federal grants, and that's where Weed Act support came in. So they've been able to sustain themselves because they got the help with grant writing and what have you. Otherwise, they, would have, they wouldn't have the staff appropriate. But we know that these services are so unique to our uh, LA County and so deserved and needed. And if we don't have staff ready to write the grants, then we're not gonna see the assistance provided to our community that really is compelled to say, come on county, help us out here. So thank you for the question. And I look forward to working with our CEO on this matter and our EO. Thank you. Thank you. Hearing no other comments, item 10 is before us, moved by Supervisor Salif, uh, seconded. Um, by Supervisor Mitchell, since your co-author is not here, to approve the item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 10 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Item 20, general tax on cannabis businesses in the unincorporated areas of the county, which was held by Supervisor Barger. Supervisor? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank um, Rob, uh, Raphael and Punahe uh, and the staff of both the um, Office of Cannabis Management and the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs for their work on this effort. It's been truly um, a lot of work. I also want to thank um, the Altadena, Juniper Hills, Acton Town Councils, and of course, the Association of Rural Town Councils, and all of the constituents in my district who have reached out to my office for their engagement on this item. In February of this year, the board began the process to implement a commercial cannabis regulatory framework for the unincorporated areas of the county. During that conversation, I expressed concern for my communities, especially in the Antelope Valley, which has been faced with dangers, consequences, and repercussions of illegal cannabis grows. That concern is still a top concern of mine as it relates to the cannabis growths that are going on up there illegally. While I am supportive of moving forward, putting this tax resolution uh, for the voters to decide, I think it's important that we clarify what this tax resolution does and does not do, because you heard many call in today that were, that were a little uh, unclear in terms of what exactly was taking place today. My communities have reached out with these concerns and questions about outdoor grows, cannabis cultivation, enforcement, and consternation for feeling left out of the conversation by DCBA. I want to ensure the record reflects that outdoor grows will not be permitted and that cannabis cultivation referred to in this agenda item must take place in structures and not in greenhouses. Again, I am asking that the town councils, which represent all of my unincorporated areas, in the fifth district, every single unincorporated area is represented by town councils. Those individuals are, are um, elected by the people within that unincorporated area. So it's important for them to be involved, especially up in the Antelope Valley, which has been so disproportionately impacted by illegal grows. I think it's important also that we educate our communities about the components of our legal. And I emphasize legal because someone called in and talked about illegal. This is legal cannabis framework and how efforts such as those to enhance our enforcement and abatement efforts to eradicate illegal cannabis grows are part of the equation. We are looking at using this to actually protect against the illegal cannabis grows. 
My constituents have expressed confusion with the tax ordinance, including a provision to tax cultivation in outdoor and mixed light facilities, despite even though we have stated that cannabis cultivation will only be allowed in enclosed structures. This has been said time and time again, and I've said it several times in my comments because I want to drive that point home. There are concerns with the provisions to tax illegal operations as communities feel that the county would allow illegal operations to operate as long as they are paying taxes. That is not the case. We must be inequivocal, inequivocal in our position that we will not tolerate illegal operations as these ultimately undermine our efforts for legal cannabis framework and the law. So again, going forward, it's imperative that the rural unincorporated communities are continually engaged as part of the process. As we work to right the wrongs of the past that resulted from the criminalization of cannabis, we must ensure that we do not create new or additional harms to rural communities that are part of our process. And to the individual, I, I can't remember who called in, but the report that was done, um, the final re uh, revenue analysis in the, of the commercial cannabis industry, it does make reference on page five to um, remote rural areas of the counties, unincorporated areas could be attractive for outdoor or mixed light cultivation. That was not a recommendation. That was merely um, uh, 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 something that was included as part of a report that is not being adopted today. So I wanna again set the record straight with that. So I will be supporting this today because it does in fact protect and moves forward to protect my constituencies up in the Antelope Valley that are currently facing such incredible illegal activity with these um, uh, illegal marijuana grows. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Solis? Yes, thank you uh, also, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I just want to briefly go over um, how this came about. As, as we know, after the passage of Prop 64, our board prohibited commercial cannabis activities, including the sale, manufacturing, testing, and cultivation of cannabis, which was intended to be temporary until we could develop and establish regulations to which we're looking to send to the voters of LA County through this ballot measure. Back in 2017, we explored implementing a commercial cannabis program and the Office of Cannabis Management, OCM, published a thorough report held by an extensive stakeholder process that included public health advocates, industry leaders, researchers, and stakeholders, as well as community members. Since that time, the field of cannabis regulation, as you know, has changed dramatically and widespread commercialization is continuing, as you know, to gain momentum. However, while hundreds of thousands of people are benefiting from the economic opportunities presented by this new market, there still remains inequities that continue to persist. For example, like Latinos who make up 19% of the U.S. population, only 5.7% of America's estimated 30,000 cannabis companies are Latino-owned. This is despite many social equity programs which have prioritized applicants from communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Back in July of 2021, this board asked OCM to revisit their previous recommendations to update them with best practices and lessons learned and to return with recommendations that were firmly rooted in equity. Their report back set in motion a critical, critical pivot in the way we think about cannabis licensing, and it is not without challenges, as we all know. This is rooted in various factors, including the fact that cannabis continues to be one of the most highly regulated industries in the country, along with high startup costs and numerous barriers to entry. And additionally, many social equity applicants who are often directed to the cannabis market as an, exception, as an exceptional opportunity to build generational wealth are expected to succeed without the support to compete with larger industry actors, support systems that include access to capital, education, or necessary, or necessary networks. Thus, it is clear that if we want to create a cannabis licensing program that can reduce inequities, we have to remove those barriers and invest in resources to promote the creation of a sustainable and responsible market. This program is set to launch with a relatively low number of initial licenses, as was stated before, with priority for equity and equity building applicants. 
I'd like to reiterate that our departments explore all options to prevent the over-concentration of operators in geographical areas. I'd also like to state that any revenue generated in the unincorporated areas from the cannabis business tax held in the county's general fund should benefit targeted programs and services in the unincorporated areas from which they are generated. As research indicates, a well-regulated and compliant cannabis business can mitigate crime rates in our vicinities. The number of unregulated and illegal cannabis pop-ups operating within the unincorporated areas that has steadily increased over the past years with upwards of 150 unlicensed pop-up today putting consumers at risk by potentially providing tainted and unregulated products and creating an environment for organized crime to infiltrate and thrive. Enforcement, as you know, alone is not enough. But I do believe that there's an opportunity for a marketplace to improve the safety of legal cannabis products and limit the health risks associated with unregulated marketplaces. This market must be balanced against public health and safety considerations to mitigate health and social disparities. Moving forward with this regulation and oversight through an equity lens and framework will ensure we keep the public and our consumers safe. OCM's board letter lays out a strong regulatory framework that is a foundation of all this work. And I wanna thank everyone that has been involved in this, all the departments, as well as, um, as well as our county council, our CEO, and all of the stakeholders that have been engaged. And I hope that everyone will pass this letter. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank, this you. thank you. Any additional um, comments from supervisors? Hear no other comments. Item 20 is before us. Moved by Supervisor Barger. Oh, did I hear someone? Supervisor Barger, is that you? Okay. All right. Um, moved by Supervisor Barger. Seconded by Supervisor Solis to approve the item. Executive Officer, call the roll. Item 20 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you. There are no specials today. So at this point- Madam Chair, can I just ask one thing? Is I, It wasn't a special until public comment. On that United Mental Health Promoters, can, can we get a report back from the um, CEO in terms of what um, exactly is going on as it relates to SEIU and the request? On the promotor- That's just program. a yeah, on the yes, on the on the United Mental Health Promoters um, uh, that were mentioned during public comment, a couple called in from SEIU regarding salaries, and I, I just want to get an understanding. It's just a report back. Not uh, not, uh, now, but on not now, but on not now, but yeah, not for today. On just a report agenda. back. Got it. Yes, CEO. Thank you. You're, you're good with that. We're, we're good with that. We're also happy to provide a, a written update if that's uh, more convenient and quicker. That'd be perfect. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, having dispensed with all of that business, let's go ahead. Executive officer, could you please read us into closed session? In accordance with Brown Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS1, conference with labor negotiator fees at Davenport and designated staff. And item CS2, Department Head Performance Evaluations, as indicated on the posted and supplemental agendas.
The board is currently in closed session and will return to open session once closed session has ended.
Supervisor Kuehl? Here. Supervisor Barger? Here. Executive Officer, please read the report of action. The following is a report of action taken in closed session on August 9th, 2022. Item CS1 and CS2, no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes today's meeting. Please note that the meetings of August 16th and 23 have been canceled in that this is our um, summer break. The next regular meeting of the board will be held on Tuesday, August 30th. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.